Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing? Is it is this the first time we've uh, live streamed, Adam? Uh, yeah, man, definitely. I think so. Okay, I think so. Okay, everyone. So we we're getting set up, and I'm having a problem. The normal thing that uh, gives me a sound readout here is malfunctioning and not giving me a sound readout. So we're just gonna do a, a quick sound check here at the beginning. Um, let us know basically if our if our volume is appropriate and um, if we're roughly even in volume. So this is about the rate I talk about. Adam, let's uh, uh, let's go back and forth. Matter of fact, Adam, just tell us uh, tell us about yourself and uh, what you do, and that'll that'll then everyone can uh, check your audio. All right. Well, first I got to do like my own launch line. You you do TikTok time to rock. I'm gonna do talk tick time to kick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how that goes. That, that's right. That yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yeah. That's not yeah. So that's yeah, not Adam Coleman. That's not derivative at all. <laughs> not, not at all, man. I, I just made it up just now. Freestyle. Straight freestyle. <laughs> it's off the top of you, off the top of the dome right off there, the man. Dome. That's how we get down out here, man. Off the dome. <laughs> so yeah, man. Uh, you know, like you said, I'm, I'm Adam Coleman, man, of uh True ID Apologetics uh YouTube channel. Y'all definitely check me out here on YouTube. And um yeah, man, I'm just uh a couple years ago I started a podcast. Uh and then you know, guys like yourself and Vocab Malone chastised me heavily for not being on YouTube. And stuff my game up, and, you know, doing these videos and whatnot. So I've been I've been trying to tighten up a little bit, and um, been dropping videos, man, uh, primarily on like black atheism, dealing with Hebrew Israelites, uh, starting to you know get my Islam Islam game on, and uh, you know things of that nature, man. You know, definitely dealing with a lot of the uh, worldviews and objections to Christianity that are gaining traction in the African American context, urban context, and so forth. And uh, you know, just touching all kind of stuff, man. So yeah, that that's me right there, man. Mm -hmm. You know, happy to be here, bro. Yep. And uh, Adam is one of the guys whose uh, channel is going to be blowing up. Uh, started hearing when did I start hearing about you? Last year, like three, like yeah, yeah. like three different people in three different parts of the country, all within about a month space. Said, "Hey, you should check out, uh, you should check out Adam Coleman, man. This guy's uh, this guy's sharp." So. Yeah, well, you know, actually, I think they were talking about a different Adam Coleman, but it just, I just left up and confused and got me. Yeah. So, so here I am. There's some, there's some super brilliant Adam Coleman somewhere, and no one knows it because every time right. someone someone finds out about him, they think it's you. They think oh, it's oh, me. hey, yeah, check, check this out. Years, check out what I got here. Oh, the, <laughs> is that, it's a jihadi tears. Jihadi bro. tears. You got to label your, nice. wa your water bottle. There you go. There you go. I'm so thirsty. I bet I kill this. I bet I kill this uh, two thirds of a gallon here. Anyway, yeah, I ain't seen you in a while, man. So when I when I thought when I saw that you uh, lost that weight, I thought the coronavirus got you, dog. I'm like, oh man, yeah, my man got got out here. You no, know? it's been <laughs> caught, you, caught you slipping, bro. Adam Adam's commenting on the fact that I lost about 20 pounds over over the past month, but uh, there, there's a reason for that. See, look, Adam, let me break this down to you. If you want to okay. play, you ever seen Chris Hansen's to uh, to catch a predator? You ever see that show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, if you want to play Chris Hansen in uh, a parody video called To Catch a Prophet, <laughs> you, can't be, you can't be fat Chris Hansen, right? You can't do it. So, so sometimes you just got to get all shredded up and play Chris Hansen, right? <laughs> there you go. There you go, bro. I see you, dog. <laughs> all right, let's check, out some, uh, let's check out some comments. Guys, just so you know, th this is the plan right here. So we know some of you are living perfectly normal lives right now, right? Uh, we know some of you may be in areas that, uh, that aren't really affected. Uh, we know others might be locked down. And if you're locked down long enough to where you, you're not really going outside, you're stuck indoors a lot, you get what's called cabin fever. You start, start getting a little, a little crazy. Now, I spent years locked up, so that wouldn't bother me at all. Um, but uh, basically, basically, uh, we know a lot of people are going to be stuck indoors for a while. So we want to we wanna go live whenever we can at night. And so we formed yep. the Flu Tank Clan. Flu Tang Clan ain't nothing to cough on. Flu Tang Clan ain't nothing to cough on, ladies and gentlemen. So right. we started the Flu Tang Clan. Look, hey, what is? Look at this. Where'd he go? Nope. Um, not quite. Not quite. Nope. We are Flu Tang forever. Flu Tang Killer Bees. Um, let's see who else we got. Uh, yeah, Aiden uh, Peterson. You remember? Not, you're, not greetings. You remember Aiden, right? Yeah. He just boom. You know, he, he's in the mix, and so he gets out there. Whereas we're dealing with. Um, I mean, it was known to be like you know one of the tougher like camps. I mean, they, you know, they definitely tend to stand their ground on, on what they what they rock with. But he's not just standing around; he's like actually engaging this stuff, man. So like he was in the mix, man. We we had what's, what's my boy from uh from uh the, the Dutch rapper we had with us, man. Oh yeah, what's, what's his name? Guy? What's that guy's name? Yeah, I forget, man. I forget. He had a weird Dutch name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's like freestyling on the train and stuff. I mean, we had we had a squad in in in, in in multiple languages too. <laughs> right, right, right. 
Yeah, it was dope. It was dope. I see vocabs in the chat. Vocabs over here. Him. How did he get a? How did he get a wrench, man? Huh? Vocab. I don't vocab know. in the chat. Uh, he. I probably left my uh, left my laptop open one day when I was over at his house, and then uh, he probably like made himself a moderator or something. Right. 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 You meant to block him or something like that, and just push the wrong button. Is that what? Was that what happened? Yeah. No. No. He probably. He was probably. He went, probably went on my computer when I wasn't paying attention. Made himself a moderator, and then you know I don't know a lot about computers to to fix that. Um, right. Right. Wait. 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 Hey. Hey. King Kong said. King Kong said Chris Hansen got caught himself. Is that true? Did that happen? Did I? Because I did he really? I, I don't know. I, I haven't heard anything about it. Um, <laughs> be messed up. Like Chris Chris Hansen got caught himself. Oh, I, I had no idea. No, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know if he's just. I don't know if he's just joking or something like that, or if. Uh, oh, maybe. Or if he's serious. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. But uh, yeah, anyone yeah. hear about that? If that, if he did. Yeah, on, on a serious tip, man. Like this. Uh, this uh, virus, Jane, is no joke, man. I mean, it's it's uh, I got cabin fever so bad, I actually ate a salad the other day and liked it. That's how bad it's getting out here, man. Whoa. It's getting bad, bro. That's bad. It would have to get really bad before I, like, turned into a rabbit and started eating salads. Right. I actually enjoyed it. I said, man, what's wrong with me? I, I must be coming down with it. Do we have any questions so far coming? Or I, I don't know oh, there, there, there's a bunch. Guys, and, and just so you know, we, we, we've got a topic. We're going to talk about God and, and coronavirus. And what we mean by that is, uh, you know, we're sitting here. Uh, I'm sitting here responding to a lot of the Muslim comments that, uh, that I get about, you know, they're trying to show that Muhammad must be a prophet because of something he said when... If you look, if you take a look at what he actually said, it would prove the opposite if it proved anything. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be making, I just made one today, but there are plenty more uh, videos to be made about uh, Muslim imams and sheikhs claiming that, oh, the coronavirus is Allah's punishment for this or Allah's punishment for that. And he's punishing this group. And then it like ends up affecting Muslims as well and so on. So anyway, I'm going to be making fun of, you know, I'm just going to be making fun of comments like that. Um, but uh you know there, there there is a more serious issue right that we are we're we're christians yeah. we believe in a god who uh, loves us we believe you know in a god who historically has performed all kinds of miracles and yet we are confronted with something like coronavirus where keep in mind this is this is not nearly as bad as a lot of things that have happened through 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 history right smallpox bad stuff it's pretty uh, bad bubonic yeah, bad. bubonic yeah. plague Really, really right. bad. Uh, you know, just, just wars. I mean, you know, you're talking uh, millions upon millions of people killed. Um, Europe, uh, Asia, and so lots of horrible things going on. So, Definitely. you know, Definitely. the issue of, of, of human suffering as a result of disease is, is nothing new. But we have such comfortable lives compared to lots of people throughout history that these things tend to stand out much more to us and tend to... Uh, tend to make us think, you know, far more because we we become we become far more hedonistic. You know what I'm saying? Become more yeah, hedonistic yeah, yeah. so that when something interferes with that, then it's oh my goodness! I thought God was was looking out for me. When I mean historically, I mean, gosh, you know, this is this is the God who allowed the bubonic plague. This is the God who allowed smallpox and so on. So, uh, we'll, right, right, yeah, right. So we'll be talking a little bit about what's called the uh, the problem of evil, but also since this is. Uh, you know, since we know people are are trapped inside and stuff, we're gonna be uh, we're also gonna be pretty we're also gonna be pretty uh, comments oriented. Meaning, if, if we end up going off track, just just chatting with people, we're gonna we're gonna let that happen because we just just for uh, just for for the, for people who are who are caught in who are trapped inside, right? And you're stuck if you're stuck at your computer, uh, because exactly, yeah, especially you know what I'm saying, Adam. There there are people who just live alone. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, and actually, this is an opportunity. I mean, it's, it's like one of those times where it's like, okay, you know, for years we talked about how like social media is is driving people apart, you know, what I mean? and affecting social interactions like in a negative way. But it's it's actually crazy that, you know, we're in a situation now where it's really the opposite. Mm -hmm. Whereas the fact that we have access to you know platforms like these where we can get on and you know hang out with people and uh, you know maybe you know take a little uh, take their minds off of, off of something, you know, at least for a little while, you know. They can stare at our at our ugly mugs for a little bit, and uh, if if anything, just kind of get a little comedy off of that, man. You know, and if we bless people in the process, then then we've done some good, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, I know we're joking around and stuff, but I mean, but at the same time, and you know, you know, we've talked about this, but I think this is why ministries like these are so important. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we live in you know the twenty whatever <laughs> was it twenty first century wherever we are. We're tw it's twenty twenty, you know, and uh, you know, ministries have an opportunity to affect people. In ways that I mean, shoot, I mean, where in human history could you have access to you know this amount of people during an incident like this? You know, matter of fact, our homeboy John, mm -hmm. uh, he just dropped a video. Uh, I guess it's been a couple of weeks ago now, where he was talking about what's called the Plague of Cyprian in North Africa and the Roman, uh, uh, you know, in uh, Rome as well, 
where you had uh, the church able to you know get out there and be a witness. And he had, you know, John McRae from What Do You Mean has a dope video on that. You know, what I mean, but, you know, at, back in the third, you know, second or third century, whatever that was. I mean, they didn't have YouTube. They didn't have, you know, what we have now. So, you know, how could we not take advantage of you know, what we got, you know, and, uh, you know, take opportunity to, to bless some folks, man. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <clears throat> the uh, couple comments here. Uh, <laughs> oh, Fred Sanford. Yeah, I saw one too, Fred yeah. Sanford. By the way, this is the Fred Sanford. Is the Fred did, did you did, the Fred did you used to watch for, uh, Sanford and Son? Of course. I grew up. You I, big I grew up. I grew up on that. Aunt, Aunt, Aunt Esther was my favorite, probably my favorite character of all time on any TV show. Right, right. Uh, Aunt Esther, man. Uh, the, you know what? I, you know what I really like where they can take a, a character that, in theory, should be strongly disliked by people, but people love the character anyway. And Aunt uh, Esther's uh, one of those, yeah, right? Yeah. It's like super judgmental Christian woman calling everyone <laughs> heathen, smacking people <laughs> with her purse, always threatening everyone with hellfire. And um, everyone just loved her, man. So, she's so, hilarious. Yeah, man. she's hilarious. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I remember. Uh, I see a couple uh, questions too, man. So whenever you, you, want you, to you, you, you can, you can jump in with any anything you want. We'll, we'll chat with people. We'll uh, when people uh, we we can get to our topic whenever we don't have questions to answer. But yeah, cool, cool. Um, yeah. So actually, I'm, I'm gonna throw out one for. Like, oh yeah, quick question. Like, do you do uh, um, super chats first? Is that how you do it on your channel? This is my uh, first time. Yeah. I'm a first timer, man. You gotta, you gotta show me the rules, man. You got. You, you can, you can, you can answer. You can answer any question at all that you want. So we don't, we don't stick to the the super chats. But you know, if someone, if someone's a super chat. Uh, basically, it makes it more visible, and it actually, it, it's it's highlighted on my on my computer. So that, that will get gotcha. that will get more attention. But no, feel free to answer anything you see. Cool, cool. Okay, cool. I see one from uh, John Buckley. He said, "Either of you two think the end is here?" Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna be upfront and say like eschatology in terms of like you know theology about the end times and all that. That's probably you know the the area <laughs> that I'm least sure about. I mean, I can sit in. I, I tell people all the time mm -hmm. that I can sit in a, in a chat about like you know, pre mill or something like that and be like, man, that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, I sit in somebody who's like, you know, I'm learning this and, you know, they'll make a case. I'm like, man, that makes a lot of sense. It's like, yeah, yeah, I have no idea. But, you know, when I think about the words of Jesus, I don't have it right in front of me right now, but he talks about how there's going to be wars and rumors of wars and pestilence and all these different things. And he says, but the end is not yet. You know, so I don't think that necessarily from events like these, you can really say, boom, like this, this right here, you know, we must be at the end. I mean, because again, I mean, you know, I think you, you captured it perfectly that um, pandemics, I mean, it's really a part of human history, actually. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's 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 not something that's new. I mean, there's been all kinds of plagues. We've had famines and things like that. So I don't think you can really look at any individual incident and say, boom, you know, this must be the end. Because Christ said, you're going to have all this crazy stuff going on, but the end is not yet. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you know, for me, um, I don't take it to be, you know, that this is the end. Now, I'm not going to I'm not going to lie to you. I got a little shook. I don't know if people are aware of it, but actually right now in East Africa, there's like this humongous, like, uh, like just outbreak of locusts right now. This like eating its oh. way across East Africa. Well, anytime you hear about locusts, that makes you, that makes you think about, yeah, uh, about the Bible, right? Like, yo, <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't gonna lie, man. I got a little shook at that point. I was like, man, hold up, yo. <laughs> oh no. I looked at my wife. I was like, yo, man. We might be in, we, we might be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? You know, but I mean, I got kind, of, kind of jokingly. I, I don't really believe that. I mean, I, I think again, for any given instance, you know, these things happen. And I mean, really, when you think about it, given how people can, are are more mobile now than they used to be, mm -hmm. I mean, viruses can travel at least among human beings a lot quicker. So, you know, I, I personally, I, I don't. You can take it from there, but I don't think it's the end. No, no, person. no. You're correct. I mean, that that is. I mean, you know, like like even during the times of of bubonic plague, in order for that to spread from you know one main area to another it had to be ships rolling in and that's actually how they invented the sort of modern you had you had people who would kind of be quarantined you know be separated and stuff like that like they, historically people would do that with lepers or you know even something like right. chicken pox and stuff like get away from me um but as far as quarantine in the modern sense of hey your ship just pulled into port you need to separate everyone on your ship for 40 days over there in that area where you're not around anyone and you need to right. show us after that 40 days that none of you is showing any symptoms of bubonic plague before we're going to let you in there. Um, that was in, invented as a, that, that sort of modern concept was, uh, was a result of that. But notice, even back then, if you wanted sure. to, if you wanted to bring bubonic plague to a, to a new area, 
uh, you know, a, a ship had to come in and there had to be rats on the ship and the, the rats crawl into a new area and they've got the fleas that are carrying the bubonic plague and so on. And right, so, right, right. Uh, but now with, you know, planes just crisscrossing all the time and who knows what in the world's going to come out. Because um, keep keep in mind, you know, coronavirus has, you know, depending on where you are, sometimes there are uh, low death rates. Sometimes there are, there are pretty disturbingly high uh, death rates, especially mm-hmm. among the, the elderly and so on. But uh, uh, I mean, there's nothing there's nothing that would I mean, it, you know, the death rate could have been like 40 or 50 percent. Right. And it could, have, it, you know, a disease could come mm-hmm. out that with a with a death rate of 40 or 50 percent that has a. Uh, you know, that has a, you know, like for the first two weeks, you don't even know you have it. And then all of a sudden you start dying. So for that two weeks, right. you've, been, you've been spreading it to everyone else around you. That stuff, you know, that stuff could could just come out of nowhere. And so, yeah, we are in a different age of history when uh, something like that could, something like that. It's a different could, world, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Be pretty it's real, cool, though. It's tight. It makes you, makes you want to go buy a cabin out in the woods. I mean, on the you know, on some mountain. And have that thing, Bruh. have that thing loaded up with like two, two, three years supply of food up there and. You food, ammo, mm-hmm. everything you need, man. Just get ready for that zombie apocalypse or whatever. <laughs> you see, you, you start thinking of these guys who have like bunkers, you know, bunkers in their basement loaded with like MREs and like an arsenal down there. You start thinking, hey, maybe these, right, right. maybe these dudes got a point, man. He's on, he's on to something. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, you know what's funny? Actually, you know, I mean, tell me what you think about this. So now, now, mind you, I am a recovering conspiracy theorist. You know what I'm saying? I used to be like. I, you know, in my younger days, I was definitely heavy on the government's manufacturing stuff. And the white man, and, you, know, you was, say like, it. Go ahead and say it. The white man is behind <laughs> everything. Know, all right, you know? well, hey, I, I'm keeping it real. You know, like <laughs> I just, I just thought for sure the white man was going to come up with some disease and just eradicate us all by accident or whatever. It was going to happen eventually. You know what I mean? So my thing is, I think like now, you know, of course, I'm, I'm not along those same lines now, but. When I think about like the different movies that we watch, or like I'm, I'm a video game guy, so games like The Last of Us and stuff like that, or you know these these games where it's like a this dystopian future where it's like all these zombies and stuff. Like I mean, I think I feel like in instances like these, like in my mm-hmm. mind, when I heard about the pandemic, like I felt like part of me kind of went there. It's like oh snap, I'm gonna have to like I'm gonna just like bug out and go in a cabin, you know, get me a shotgun and just you know ward off these scores of, of half humans or something. I mean, mm-hmm. like, I think we can take it to the stream, but I think media really impacts how we interpret events in the world though. You know, yeah. does that make sense? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 On the, on the issue of uh, the, the, the question was, uh, you know, is this the end? Um, yeah. Just, just my view on it. Um, uh, basically for 2000 years, people have been looking at various things saying, look, this is, you know, this, this is, uh, this is, you know, Hey, it's here. This is, this is it. Um, I think so. I think things will be a lot worse when, <laughs> when the, when the end comes personally. Uh, but, but yeah, I'm kind of like you in that. I don't, I don't have a, a firm position on, you know, eschatological issues and stuff like that. Um, if I read the book of revelation, you say, David, what, what's that mean? I go, I don't know. Well, it means Jesus wins. That's, uh, that's about, that's, that's my takeaway. So yeah, I don't get too much, I don't get, I don't get too much more uh, specific than that. Uh, here's a question from, uh, Hi to Cole. Hey David, what we what would you suggest to start studying Islam? Um, actually, I've been planning to make a video on that. If you're talking about if you're talking about books, um, been planning on making a video like you know, top five books Christians should know to start learning about Islam. But uh, yeah, Hi to Cole. I would say I would say first off, if you haven't read it, read uh, Nabil's book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. Um, you could get you know you could get a lot of the same information in there, but. It's uh, because it's told as a biography. Um, it really, it really helps you get inside the mind of someone who's raised as a Muslim. Start, start understanding their, uh, their perspective, and then you know, getting into the apologetics as well. So I would start with that, and after that, I would go to um, Norm Geisler's uh, a book with Abdul Salib called "Answering Islam." That was the first book I I read on Islam. So uh, start with those two, and uh, you'd actually be pretty good. No, <clears throat> no. All right. Well, uh, and my answer to that would be whatever David said. That that would be. <laughs> my answer to that. He's the uh, the Islam expert, you know. But yeah, actually, you know, I, I do want to say this though. I mean, as somebody, I haven't really spent a whole lot of time on Islam till like fairly recently. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, guys like yourself, you know, Sam and other guys that got me kind of really like pushing on it. And it was crazy to me is, you know, um, just as there's so much that we don't know about Islam, and there's so much that Muslims, you know, professing Muslims don't know about Islam. Yeah. I mean, when people watch your videos, sometimes, like, to be honest with you, like if they're if they're not aware of your ministry, 
they can, you know, you might be making a claim about something that's in a hadith or whatever, and people might be like, nah, that can't possibly be true. That's not in there. That's- but when you go to the source. <clears throat> It's like, oh snap! Like that's crazy, but it's it's in there. That you know what I mean? That's that's how I was. I was in a prison dorm when a Christian told me that Muhammad had a nine year old child bride. So he said he had he, he had a uh, he he had sex with a nine year old girl, um, mm-hmm. and I I was like, come on, man, <laughs> there's no way, <laughs> there's no way this dude who's influenced all these dudes around the planet. Um, you know, all these, you know, over a billion followers or whatever. There's no way this guy had sex with a nine-year-old girl. Never happened. Come on. And then, right, right, right. And then, of course, years later, I found out, I'm like, what? That's, I'm reading it right out of their sources. And it's everywhere. It's all over the place in their, yeah, in their sources. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, my goodness. If I mean, <clears throat> people, yeah, people, it's, it's basically, you look at Muslims and you say they have such a high view of, of, of Muhammad. That he must have been this really, he must just must have been this really great guy. And then if you hear he right. did this really, really bad thing, you think there's there's no way he could have done that. Otherwise, they wouldn't think of him as as you know the the, the greatest the greatest man who ever lived. And then, you know what's funny mm-hmm. is like first time I heard that, I, I was hearing it from a guy, and like my first reaction was like, "Yo, man, we gotta respect other people's religions. Like you can't be making up stuff like that. You can't, you can't say disrespectful stuff like that." Because I was like, I didn't realize it was true. You know, I was like, I was just thinking like that's something that's so mm-hmm. heinous. You shouldn't, you know, put that on somebody if it's if it's like just slanderous mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. But then come to find out, like, oh no, he really did have this nine year old, you know, child that he was essentially molesting. I mean, that's 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 crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. And and that and that ain't all he did, unfortunately. So right, yeah, pretty creepy. Yeah. Uh, Pitar Milich in the uh, super chat um, said that Imam praising coronavirus. Uh, I don't know if you saw my video a little while ago, but uh, made yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Uh, that that imam praising coronavirus forgot that Muhammad had a much more revealing problem than coronavirus, a severed aorta. Remember, I don't know if you know. I don't know if you know that background, but uh, yeah, in the Quran, Allah says, Surah sixty nine, that uh, verses forty four to forty six, I believe that if Muhammad were to invent a false revelation, Allah would sever his aorta, and then years later, Muhammad Muhammad's dying and says he he feels his aorta being severed, and so yeah, you told me about it. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. crazy. Hey, quick question. Like, how? I mean, I don't think I've asked you before. Like, how how do Muslims generally respond to that when you kind of put that before them? Is it is like a lot of pushback? Like, how do they? Like, what do they do with it? The 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 main response is that in the Hadith and in the Quran, it uses two different words for aorta, and so it's not talking about the same thing. When you can ask any Arabic speaker, they that that the words mean that they mean the same thing. It's like uh, they the aorta is also called the life artery, right? So. Mm-hmm. They're two different names, and so if I say, and I, I don't see how that gets around it, right? If I if I were to say, ah, uh, you know, uh, because the, the the way I put this is, um, if someone walks out and says, if I'm if I'm a false prophet, then God will strike me down, and then you get blasted by lightning, you know what I mean? Then you you might you might start thinking, hey, uh, maybe this guy's a false prophet. That was that was your yeah. answer, right? Well, Muhammad goes yeah. around, and he starts saying, uh, if 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 I'm a false prophet, God God would strike me down for for inventing a false revelation. He would sever my aorta. Uh, well, imagine someone comes along and says, God would sever my aorta, and then suppose he's dying a few years later, and he says, ah. Ah, I'm dying. I feel my my life artery being severed. What's your life artery? It's my aorta. Ah, right? <laughs> right. I mean, right, right. Uh, you know. Bleed no. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, that that that's the basic response. Um, and then the, the other the other kind of response is um, that this is just so, some sort of you know phrase that we don't know a lot about. Maybe it's just a kind of phrase for you know dying in a lot of pain or something like this with a lot of chest pain or something like that. And the thing is, if if that's what it is, you know, feeling my my aorta being severed is just a you know phrase for meaning I'm dying in a lot of a lot of chest pain. Well, th- well, guess what? Mm-hmm. Then, then that happened too, right? So if if that's yeah, either if, way, yeah, if that's true. just a phrase and that's what Allah means in the Quran, then guess what? That's exactly what happened to Muhammad too. So, yeah, not a not a not a lot of great responses to things like that. And if that were the only yeah, if that true. were the only thing we had about we we knew about Muhammad, then you know maybe that. You know that wouldn't be too much, but when you combine that with the other seventy-five arguments we have against his prophethood, my goodness, there, there's no one in history who's more of an obvious false prophet than him, right? There's no one you can point to. <laughs> right, right. There's a, of all the billions of people who've existed in the, in, the, in the world today, down down through history, there's no one you can point to who has a larger collection of proofs of his false prophethood than, than Muhammad. No, no one even comes close. It's not. It's not just this. It's oh, look at these. We have you know we have all these different it's ways. Of it's proof. like he's it's, it's almost like he's 
He's like the opposite of Jesus. Yeah, you, know, saying, you know, like yeah. the Old Testament. He's got all these, we got all these prophecies of like centuries of prophecies, and he's like, you know, he's fulfilling like the cult. You know what I mean? Be coming into, you know, he's riding in Jerusalem on the cult. He's doing everything to let you know that he's a Messiah. Well, like Muhammad's like the exact opposite. You know what I'm saying? He's he's doing everything he possibly can to let you know that he's not the man. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that's well. All right, th- this this question uh, is is kind of c- connected to uh, the topic that that we wanted to. Oh, so, oh side note, Mr. Phil Fox said. Uh, uh, thanks for your ministry, David, and thanks for the ad, Adam, on Facebook. Blessings and safety to all. So I guess you added him on Facebook. But, uh, oh, yeah, Phil Fox. I just added him. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. What's up, man? What's going on? Yeah, and everyone, um, uh, also, Adam, a link to Adam's um, uh, YouTube channel is in the description box if you want to uh, if you want to click on that, which you, you should because uh, he's going to be ta- he's tackling a lot of issues that a lot of other apologists aren't, aren't tackling. Uh, here's a question. That's actually connected to what we were just talking about, but also connected to, kind of connected to God and coronavirus. Um, mm-hmm. This is from Riaz Qureshi. He said, uh, why do you think God has allowed Islam to prosper so much, even though it is evil? So this is a question. You have, you have what's called, you have what's called like, you know, natural evil, right? Like diseases, mm-hmm. earthquakes, um, typhoons, hurricanes, tornadoes, um, all kinds of you know all kinds of diseases things like that these are these are called natural evil meaning that you know there, there's it's it's not that the, the typhoon or the tornado is intending to kill people it's not that coronavirus is in, right. intending to kill people so so there's not a moral element so it's just called natural evil it's right. evil in the in the sense that it has this impact on people but uh it, it's it's a it's a different kind of evil it's not moral evil whereas uh, you also have you know moral evil which is human beings um, intending to do certain things. And I think, you know, false ideologies that are dangerous and, and bad would fall into the category of, uh, of moral evil. So uh, why, wh- what, would, what would your thoughts be? Why do you think God allows sort of false ideologies, dangerous ideologies that lead to a lot of suffering, something like Islam, which leads to lots of persecution against uh, Christians, against Hindus, right. against Jews, right. against all kinds of people. Um, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm going to answer in a way that, um, you know, since we got Vocab Malone in the chat, I'm going to answer in a way that's like smoke to his eyes and like, you know, you know nails on a chalkboard. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm of the perspective that I really believe that um, free will of some sort, you know what I'm saying, is essential to having an authentic, loving relationship of any kind, you know, and I think that God, you know, we think about, you know, God is a trinity, you know, God, the Bible obviously tells us God is love, but he's also, you know, you know, uh, he's, you know, three persons, you know, in one substance, three persons, one God, right? So, you know, God is inherently social as well, you know what I'm saying, like, relationship is just, it, it's a part of who he is, if you will, it's like a natural dynamic. So, I think that, you know, when you kind of put those two together, um, you know, God, his intent for mankind kind of flows from that. I'm saying he really wants real relationship, real loving relationship with mankind. Um, But I think as an aspect of that, I believe that he allows us to choose, you know, however we want to, you know, you know, frame that. I think that God allows us to um, either align with him and, you know, uh, walk with him in a way that glorifies him in the way that we're created to function. Or we can rebel. We can mm-hmm. we can sin and and do things that are contrary to His will, and I don't think that He you know uh, just uh, restricts us you know from doing so. I think that we can sin all we want. You know what I mean? If, if you want, if that's what you want to do, and then bust hell wide open, hey, go for it. You know, and I just think as a function of that, of people choosing to reject God, choosing to reject um, you know the cross and so forth, um, they create. Um, their own, they create idols. I'm saying, man, you know, we we were we were made to worship something, someone, and you know, be, to be more specific. And so, when we take God off the throne, when we when we pull put God out, out of the picture, then we just end up replacing them with something else. You know, and in the case of Islam, you know, they replace him with you know Muhammad and you know the, and the Quran. And you know, they treat the Quran as like this infallible source. And it's just at the end of the day, it's, it's idolatry. It's it's man. Uh, doing something that he was um, uh, is, is a counterfeit of what he's created to do. And I think that we're all um, can actually take heed and actually to kind of bring it around to, to us, you know, to try to make it personal. I think that we um, should take note of idols in our own lives. 
You know what I'm saying? Like we, like just because you know the Lord and are walking with him and all that kind of stuff, we're prone to put something in his place. That's the whole story of the Old Testament with, with Israel, uh, more specifically. Mm-hmm. That's what we do, and so it's something that we can all take heed of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I can't, re- I can't resist. Some, but someone's uh, <laughs> Tim Nick is uh, asked if you're Lennox Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> I've gotten that several times. Honestly, yeah. you know, I, yeah. I wish I could do the accent. Right? Yeah, until yeah, until, until you until until you open your mouth, you could pass. But uh, yeah, as soon as you open your mouth, then it's uh, no, nope, that guy's not British. Um, definitely not. Definitely not. Um, yeah, uh, you know, you know, it's interesting if we're if we're talking about ideologies and you know why does God allow something like Islam to because uh, you know w- within a couple of decades it's it's uh, if nothing changes. If nothing changes, just based on birth rates, Islam is set to surpass Christianity as the dominant religion in the world. And if you guys think things are rough now, <laughs> my goodness, wait till Islam becomes the uh, the 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 biggest uh, biggest uh, religion in the world. So you know the question is why why would God uh, allow that kind of thing? And you know I, I'm kind of like you, like like you know what what do you mean? That's 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 our responsibility, right? If they're if right. I, I, right, right. I believe if every Christian in the world would learn some basic facts about Islam and Muhammad and the Quran and go to Muslims, especially now that we have, I mean, every opportunity in the world, uh, I don't think Islam could stand up to to scrutiny. Instead, we have right. uh, instead we have a handful of Christians dealing with Islam and then a bunch of Christians sort of stabbing them in the back saying what are you doing why, why don't you leave those muslims alone what are you a bunch of haters what are you a bunch of bigots and stuff like that and so right, uh, right, right. so i look at the the problem as as kind of our fault as far as as far as the situation we're in right now right and i, mm-hmm. I you know i i tell people this we i mean we have opportunities that that christians couldn't have dreamed of for for 14 centuries if you, whether 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 you want to you know you want to preach the gospel to muslims or you want to refute islam or you're, you're like me and you want to do both right you want to refute right, islam right, right. and and preach the gospel to muslims no one could have dreamed of a situation where you can you know pull a phone out of your pocket and talk to you know a muslim in saudi arabia on facebook they couldn't have dreamed of a mm-hmm. scenario like that right i mean if you mm-hmm. if you just go back a few decades if you wanted to talk to if you wanted to talk to muslims you had to go to some really really dangerous areas and if you were at all successful you're going to get your head chopped off and so you had to be putting your life on the line now it's just so easy so on the one it's hand too easy, man. on the one hand we have all the technology in the world to reach any muslim with an internet connection all over the world and at, at the at the exact same time at the exact same time that happens, the exact same time that we have access to Muslims around the world, every country, we also get open access to their sources, right? Because yeah, keep in yeah. mind, keep in mind, for 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 14 centuries, you had you had Arabic speaking Christians and so on, but the vast majority of the world, if they they had no access to Muslim sources, right? And uh, even even up until very very recently, this gave Muslim preachers who are willing to deceive their listeners. A massive advantage, so that um, when the Muslim uh, speakers came to, let's say, Harlem and said, "Hey, you want to stick it to Whitey? You want to stick <laughs> it to Whitey? Here's the religion that promotes the equality of everyone. Uh, there's never been. You know, we don't have. We never had slavery in here. We never did anything like that in Islam. This is the religion that liberates right. the slaves, frees everyone, and so. So this is the religion. You, you want to listen to that Christianity stuff that you know enslaves everyone, right? And if you were in Harlem, you did not have source. You did not have the sources. You did not. Didn't know. You didn't have Sahih al Bukhari. You didn't have Sahih Muslim. You did not have the ability to point out what the Hadiths say about Muhammad and his numerous black slaves and him having sex with his female slaves. You didn't have the access, right? So this allowed right. Islam to spread uh, in an atmosphere where people just have no access to to the truth. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of this gets handed to us. It's. I mean. If I'm thinking, you know, if if God is involved in something, right, in in something like, you know, doing something about Islam, I say, here's a generation of Christians. We're worried about jihad. We're worried about the impact Islam has on women. All these kinds of things. We recognize that it's 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 about to become much more powerful than it has ever been before. And simultaneously, we've been handed every resource we need to completely refute all the lies that this religion has has been based on. And simultaneously. Right. We can give a presentation of the gospel to Muslims in every country on the planet 
I look at that and say, wow, if anything is a blessing from God to be able to deal with Islam, that is. But notice it still right. comes it still comes down to us. And one thing I wanted to add here is um, having discussions with lots of atheists and so on, I, I find that I, I simultaneously have a, a higher view of, of human beings and a lower view of human beings, right? When, mm, when, when, yeah, when, interesting. when they start when they start talking about uh, you know like Matt Dillon when he starts talking about hey you know we just you know human beings in general we seek we seek the good of humanity and we we seek you know human well-being and I'm like I'm just thinking what planet do you live on man I live in a planet where people will eat each other alive as soon as something starts going really? wrong uh, and, right. then, and then he's saying and then he's saying you know we could we could build a, a foundation for morality based on nothing but selfishness right since I'm if I'm selfish <laughs> and I want what's best for me well I need a good right. world to live in and so you know we'll encourage we'll encourage everyone to be moral and I'm saying well what what if you what if you what if you could steal a bunch of money and you knew you could get away with it and he's saying no you wouldn't want to do that because it would affect the global economy and so like, have you ever actually met a a, a really selfish person because no one's thinking man i could steal this 10 million dollars but i don't want to affect the global economy uh, he was he was even he was even saying you wouldn't steal a coke because he'd worried about the price of coke being i think he said something like that i have to go back and check out the clip but uh so anyway so in that sense, well, I mean, I'm gonna just say that. I mean, that's how he thinks. He, he's a better human being than I am. I'm, I'm telling you that, right? Well, yeah, but I mean, it just left to myself. Man, hey, look, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going for mine. It's, that is what it is. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, 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 my idea is, it, if that's how you view other human beings, and you think that's what the world is like, I think you're you're delusional and borderline insane. If that's if that yeah, yeah, yeah. if that's the takeaway message you get, right? So, on the one hand, I'm looking around at people and I'm thinking, you know, you know, uh, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, Pol Pot, all these guys. You know, the, Hitler did not go kill all those people himself. He didn't kill them. Everyone else killed right. them. Everyone else killed those people for him. Uh, yeah, same yeah, same yeah. with Stalin. Same with Mao. Uh, same with Pol Pot. They, they they had they had tons of people on their side in, in doing these things and uh, so right. so on the one hand morally I have a much lower view than than uh, than the view of lots of of atheists who are who are commenting but as far as like what we're here for and our role I have a much higher I have a much higher view right um, yeah, if, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you look I mean right here let's look at the beginning of Genesis here. Um, so uh, Genesis 126, then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. So we're made in the image of God and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Human beings are to rule over all the earth. God created man in his own image in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. So male and female created in the image mm -hmm. of God. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air, birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So we are here to rule, right? We bear, we bear responsibility uh, for ruling this earth. And we are, in that sense, God's representatives here on earth. We're the image of God. And we have, you know, that comes with a lot of obligations. So when we screw up and we don't do what we're supposed to do, it never occurs to me to say, man, look at this messy place I'm in right now. I really messed this house up. I got piles right. of stuff everywhere. I haven't cleaned this place. Why, God? Why? Why is this place <laughs> so messy here? I, I can't believe it. I can't believe that you would allow this. This is me, right? I'm 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 in charge of this. I'm in charge of this. this is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, actually, I'm gonna come back on that because uh, I mean, obviously, true ID. You know, the, that's my whole my, my whole thing. It stands for the real you in my go day. You know what I mean? And um, actually, shameless plug. I want to encourage people to go to my uh, my uh, channel because I actually have a whole teaching on that concept of the Imago day where I break down some of the ideas that are behind it. Just kind of share one aspect. Um, you know, one of the things that I've come across as I've been studying it. Is that term image? You know, like you mentioned, it's kind of like it means like representative figure, and you know, scholars have been able to kind of understand how that term was used in the days where you know the, the biblical authors were you know scribbling it down, and one of the ideas behind that is you know back in the day, just say you know like right now, you know, President Trump could be in any part of America like in a matter of you know minutes or an hour or whatever, you can just fly around or whatever. You know, but back then you couldn't do that. You know what I'm saying? You couldn't get to, you know, a leader couldn't get to all parts of his, mm -hmm. you know, um, his, you know, wherever he reigns, you know what I'm saying, just in a matter of minutes. And so what they would actually do is they would put like these different posts, like kind of like totem pole looking things, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. at different parts of their, you know, the, the area that they reigned over. So that when you look at, you know, the that post, you know who, you know, that area belongs to. 
You know what I'm saying? And so that's one of the ideas is kind of behind you know that word image there. And so in the sense in the earth realm, that's what we are. You know, for, you know, to to God. You know, God reigns over all. You know what I'm saying? And we're like a representative figure here in the earth, you know, showing, you know, his authority and so forth. And we're supposed to conduct ourselves in that way. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things like that um, that, that's really behind just those those two words, you know, Mm -hmm. his image and likeness. You know what I'm saying? Uh, But to your point, though, I mean, and actually this I I learned this from, um, you know, reading uh, Clay Jones. If people don't have his book. They really need to get it. I, I can maybe pull up here in a second so I can get the title. But uh, Clay nope. Jones has a has a. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 oh. Bam! There it is. Why does God allow evil? You know, right there, right there. If you don't have it, you need to get it. You need to get it. You know. And so, you know, one thing that Clay Jones points out is we really are self deceived. Like we don't realize how bad we really mm-hmm. are. You know what I'm saying until your point, like we're talking about Hitler and you're talking about. Uh, you know, Mao and all these folks. One thing that, that he struck me, he said it in a talk, actually, before I even read the book, I heard him say this in a talk, that like when you study, like, genocide and stuff like that, it's not like a bunch of, you know, people who are out of their minds mm-hmm. doing these evil things, lopping people's arms off and all that kind of stuff. He's like, he, he, the way he put it was, it's the it's your next door neighbor. Yep. It's the guy that you saw at the market yesterday buying fruit. That's the guy who, when everything goes down, is going to be sending you to the gas chamber. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, he, 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 yeah he, the- he actually, he actually, uh, in that section, uh, I remember because it stood out to me. He quoted a, a, a German, a German scholar, uh, Hannah Arendt, who said uh, she was she was talking about Eichmann, who the, the guy who o- oversaw the um, yeah. the, uh, the, uh, the the whole uh, uh, final con- solution, the concentration camp uh, system. Yeah, and she said what what was so disturbing about him and the people who are like him was how terrifyingly normal they were. These are guys who got up in the right. morning, had breakfast with their kids, played ball with their kids, went out, uh, yeah. massacred thousands of Jews, came home, had dinner, you know, sang songs, yeah. played a little, you know, tossed the ball around and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, right. so yeah, but, but, but go ahead. No, I mean, that, that's that's the thing. is, And I think sometimes we have like a false confidence in, you know, how good we think we are or, you know, and we put that. And I, and now, now, you know me, man, I, I keep it 100 at all times. You know I'm, I'm going to give a, a, a real example. Right. So. So I'm, a, I'm on this uh, mission trip in uh, in Kenya. This is back in like 2004. You know what I mean? We're out there on this mission trip. We're on this big field. And, you know, we got a whole bunch of this big church service going on in this field. Right. And so I'm look, I'm like basically playing the role of an usher. And I'm looking at the stage, and over my shoulder, I hear like this rumbling noise, like a, mm-hmm. a truck is approaching. I, I look over, and it's just like this one military vehicle, and just immediately I had, I had like this sinking feeling. I'm like, man, this is not going to be good. And so these dudes roll up, you know what I mean? Jump out. They got like the AK-47s in hand, and they're like, look, either y'all come up with some money, or it's going to be a problem. I'm <laughs> saying now. It was kind of like the movies where like everything slows down and like, all I could see was the gun. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. Like I'm not in America right now. Now I brought that up to say is like from, from somebody like myself, you know, you're brought up particularly in my context, like man, you know, Africa's the motherland, and you know, it's, it's this brotherhood mm-hmm. <laughs> among all black people. And at the time, it was like, look, they don't care where you're from, brother. Either you got this money or it's gonna be a problem. I'm saying it wasn't it wasn't none of this other stuff. I'm saying that that you know you're kind of raised on. So my whole point is. You know, we sometimes put confidence in things that really don't reflect the human condition. You know what I'm saying the reality is, as the scripture talks about, the heart of man is desperately wicked, mm-hmm. desperately wicked. You know what I'm saying I think, I think it says right after that, like, who can know it? I mean, man, we're like left to ourselves. We're in bad shape, bro. We're in bad shape. And so I think that, you know, you know again, going back to Clay Jones, when we think about, you know, why do people do bad things like or even the coronavirus, like some people. I think, and it just goes back to, I like the distinction you made, um, it's an important one, between natural evil and moral evil. And I think, you know, many atheists, at least the ones I've come across, believe that, okay, well, maybe you can deal with the moral evil part, you know, free will, da 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 But, you know, what about natural evil? You know, the free will defense doesn't touch natural evil. But I think it's because they don't understand that element of theology that you touched on a second ago. If mankind has been entrusted with stewardship over this physical earth, you know what I'm saying? Then it makes it makes a whole lot of sense that if we get out of line, then everything under us gets out of line. Mm-hmm. I'm saying it makes a whole lot of sense why there could be, you know, uh, earthquakes and all manner of you know craziness going on in the physical world, in the natural world, given that 
by us getting in sin, we've just disrupted the whole natural order from the top on down. Well, not the top because God's the top, but from mankind on down, whether it be, you know, including animals and so on and so forth. So I think, again, that free will aspect, you know, or at least I'll just put it this way for, for maybe my reform folks. I won't make it as, as spicy as that. You say just man's sin. Right. He's talking, he's, screwed he's, talking, he's talking to you, vocab. Right. <laughs> You're talking to vocab. He's going to get me tomorrow. He's gonna, well, actually, I was about to say something. that, that I, I forgot we were alive. I almost said something else. But it, <laughs> anyway, but, um, but seriously, man, it's, you know, that natural evil, I think, can be accounted for given the disobedience of mankind and the fact that we've stepped out of our stewardship mm-hmm. role and have allowed, you know, sin and brokenness to run roughshod throughout the world. I mean, I, th- I think that really accounts for it. Hence, you know, the coronavirus. You know? Yeah, um, and actually, I mean, really, guys, we, we could just, we could just uh, you know, take some other questions because that, that's, uh, we could just take, you know, random questions uh, after this because that's kind of my view, too. If, we, if you want to, you know, understand, you know, God and coronavirus, why would God allow coronavirus? Um, why does God allow these horrible things, bubonic plague and so on? And as Adam pointed out, you know, the atheists will say, yeah, OK, well, you know, maybe you could explain Hitler in terms of God giving us free will. And if we misuse it, then, you know, that that's on us. But, you know, that doesn't explain the plague or smallpox or, you know, smallpox or Spanish flu and things like that or, or coronavirus yeah. doesn't account for things like that. But really, I mean, <clears throat> I think of it in terms of once you really think about how depraved we are. And uh, in, in, Clay Jones also uh, had a section there on uh, the Stanley Milgram experiment, where uh, mm. the, the Milgram, mm. Milgram was interested in, in how all these normal people could be persuaded to go and, you know, throw, throw Jewish children in, in, a, in a gas chamber, right? And, and keep, in, keep in mind, those are the, those are the, that's the sort of thing that, that, that stands out to us most. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Nazis also had like portable gas chambers where they would show up to um, uh, sort of orphanages for the, the you know, mentally, mentally uh, k- kids with mental problems. And yep. they would put they, they would they would put the kids in the portable gas chamber and, and, and gas them all. And mm-hmm. so they were just, I mean, exterminate. And it, guess what? It was com- we, we tend to think, oh, you know, the guy that was the guy that was carrying out that order is that guy must have been like killing cats when he was a kid. No. They were, I'm sure. Yeah. There, I'm sure there were a few of those, but the, the the studies show the vast majority of people who were carrying out these orders, uh, whether it's there, whether it's uh, under Stalin, whether it's in communist China, whether it was under Pol Pot, uh, these guys were normal, normal family men who were carrying out these orders. And so uh, uh, Stanley Milgram decided to carry out um, an experiment, um, basically, mm-hmm. where he's uh, one person is ordered to shock another person in, in a way that's supposedly going to uh, teach him, and he's 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 told over and over again to give a a give a bigger shock to the person until you get to the point where the shock is supposedly possibly lethal. In other words, this might kill the yeah. person. This might kill the person and stop this person's heart. And right. he found uh, in that experiment, that initial experiment. 65 percent and there was no difference between men and women 65 percent of americans were, mm-hmm. were willing to push a button that was giving a possibly lethal shock yep. to another person for no reason at all right it wasn't oh yep. you know the world is going to be saved if you push this button and so 65 percent and then this experiment was uh, uh similar experiments were performed around the world and uh the one in germany even after the holocaust even and you'd think the german people would be i really need to think about what i'm going to do here uh 85 percent of germans again no difference between men and women 85 percent mm-hmm. of germans were willing to just from being told hey go ahead and push go ahead and push that button this might kill this person okay bam 85 percent and so I, I have to conclude that we are really morally, we are in uh, far more rebellion than we give ourselves credit for. And But here's, here's the thing. A lot of what's called the argument from evil or the problem of evil is based on the idea that when something's going on, you know, something bad in terms of natural evil is happening in the world. Well, that's a situation where God should step in and uh, rescue us from, from uh, you know, from this, 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 you know, bad thing that's oh, about yeah. to happen, this disease. And it, right. I'm thinking if you if you really come to terms, wait a minute, we are people who are supposed to be honoring God, supposed to be honoring other people, viewing each other as created in the image of God, responsibly ruling over creation. And 
between 65 and 85 percent of us would tor- would 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 torture and and possibly kill another any other <laughs> one of the others on command. Right. Uh, given the opportunity, right. we kill millions upon millions of people. And yet God is supposed to sort of swoop in like Superman every time there's something bad going on and say, hey, guys, I know you don't want me to be any part of your life. I know you don't want any, I don't even, I know you don't want to fulfill your purpose. I know you sit around whining and complaining all, all day long. Um, but, you know, I'm here. For, I'm here for you. I'm, I'm here to rush in and help uh, in this right. situation. I just I don't see where God has has any obligation to to do something like that. And so I think uh, like I'm like uh, uh, Adam here that I think there's a there's a there's a connection between. The moral evil of humanity and what's going on with uh, with the natural evil and, and God not just rushing in and, and fixing these kinds of things. Well, I mean, to that point, I mean, like, you know, you and I, we, we both have kids, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And so if my daughter or my sons, one of my sons comes to me and says, hey, my room is messed up. Uh, you know, what are we going to do about it? And I'm like, uh, clean it up, bro. <laughs> you know, clean it up. You know, if you messed it up, you know, they're the age now, you know, where they need to, you know, you know, clean up after themselves and things like that. And so actually now to, to make it even more specific, you know, whereas when my kid was, I, I've got a newborn, I've had a kid who's, he's, uh, you know, just coming up on five months old, you know what I'm saying? If he, you know, messes his diaper, I'm not going to say to him, Hey, you know, uh, you know, clean, you know, change your own diaper, mm-hmm. you know, but if I have, you know, my five-year-old, you know, drop something on the floor, I'm like, you need to clean up. There's different levels of maturity, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it came to a point where me and my wife had to have a discussion. Hey, you know what? We think they're old enough to start, you know, doing X, Y, and Z. You know what I'm saying? They need to develop, uh, you know, this character trait of, you know, being disciplined, you know, taking care of the things that belong to them. You see what I'm saying? Now, my whole point is, I think, you know, in some philosophers, they approach the problem of evil from this standpoint of, like, there is this soul-building element. You yep. know, sometimes we'll refer to it that way, right? Whereas, you know, God is not going to swoop in every time there's, like, this bad situation because whether we like it or not, there are some times where those bad situations can yield through, you know, experiencing it, developing character and so forth. You actually, you know, end up developing in ways that you otherwise would not have. Mm-hmm. You know, so they talk about soul building, you know, as an element of, of you know, why might why God might allow, you know, certain levels of evil, you know. And so I, and actually I see that in my own life right now. You know, I, I mean, I can't go out and do what I want to do. And so I'm like, okay, well, you know, I can read the word more. Or I can spend some more time in prayer. Or I can put out more YouTube videos. I can, you know, be more disciplined. You know, all, the, you know, people are having all these discussions about, you know, loving one another and holding each other in higher esteem and, and appreciating those around you in ways that maybe they wouldn't have if we continue to be distracted by, you know, video games, movies, and whatever else. And so I think that's a piece there too, you know. But I, I got a comment here, if you're cool with it, man. That's something I want to respond to. Is it uh, is know. it on different lines, or same lines? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, it is. Same lines? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, go for it. Oh no, no I'm sorry, it's on different lines. Oh, okay, different yeah, lines. yeah. I, I just wanted to add one thing. It, it, it I wanted to say it. Uh, <laughs> this, this whole. Uh, anytime this comes up, of uh, you know, atheists, you know, atheists, you know, we don't need God to tell us what to do. And so it, every every time for years now, this is. I don't remember how many years ago this was. I want to say five or six, but um, uh, I was living in the Bronx and was taking the taking the subway home, and I got back. I don't know. It was probably close to midnight, and there was uh, when I when I would get off the the subway, there's uh, there's a little drugstore that 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 stayed open till midnight, and I got off the train uh, in the Bronx almost midnight, and this uh, this woman was walking into the drugstore. With her daughter, her daughter must have been like four years old, and the mom walked in, and the daughter just stood there outside, and uh, the mom, and then, so the mom walked back out and said, "Get in here," and the girl goes, "I don't need you," and uh, the mom said, "Get in this store right now," and the girl screamed, "I don't need you," <laughs> and the mom would say, "I said, get in this store right now," and the girl goes, "I don't need you," and I'm like, "You're a four-year-old girl." Wow! In wow, the Bronx, yeah. in the middle of the night, you need your mom, right? You need your mom. You, you, you right, need right, your right. mom. So I kind of feel like we're we're like that 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 screaming little girl. We don't we don't need you. Get out of here. Get out of here, God. Just stay away until something's yeah. going horribly wrong. Okay, God, you know, come back, fix this, and then get out of our faces. Right, and, right, right. Uh, and yeah, it's all God bless America when things are going bad, and the next thing you know, we're, we're back to you know separation of church and state and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yo, yo, yo. Uh, <laughs> uh, choose jesus choose jesus said uh jesus rules everything around me 
I think he's talking about that. Uh, I think he's talking about the yeah, Wu Tang. The, the Wu Tang, right? Yeah. Matter yeah, of fact, yeah. right, right when I said, right when I said, uh, uh, Flu Tang Clan, uh, a couple yeah. days ago, I said Flu Tang Clan. You said uh, something like coronavirus ruins Cor everything yeah, around me. Yeah, Corona, ru yeah, Corona ruins everything around me. Cream, <laughs> sub the channel. Yeah. Don't let it make you ill, y'all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. All right, the the floor is yours, sir. All right, yeah. yeah now, this is a serious point right here, Dave. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying we get, I think we have a problem that you and I need to hash out. You know what I'm saying are, are we are we saying names of people or are we leaving names out as far as the comments being? Oh, made? If, they, if they're in the comments, you give their name. That's that's public. So. Oh, okay, cool. All right, so this, we we got a an allegation for you, brother. You okay. know what I'm saying? This is from Takia Watch TV. I say <laughs> it says, uh, "Let black people think for ourselves. We can agree and disagree on cultural expression of our faith." At Act 17. What? what what's up with that, man? <laughs> <laughs> what black people think of themselves, bro? What, what, what are you doing here, man? Now, now, what's he mean that 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 I should never give my view to you? Because as far as I can tell, that would be that would be like viewing you as less than everyone else, right? It's not like, oh, if I have a if I have a disagreement with this white guy, then I say, hey, here's where I think you're wrong, and here's what I think the correct view is. Now, what do you think? But if I'm with you, then I just need to be like, oh, I can't talk to you along those lines. You're you're, you're, too, you're too different. You're too different from me, sir. Um, you just go believe whatever you want. You can't be part of these conversations that we're having right now. No, you need to just go think for yourself and get you know. Yeah, you do. You think I'll do mine? Yeah, actually, you know, and I'm being funny, but I want to kind of take it back to something you said earlier. Uh, you were talking about um, Islam. You know, and I'm, I'm picking up on what he said. He says, uh, you know, we can agree and disagree on cultural expression of our faith. And I, I'm not exactly sure what it means. But, you know, I was, I was thinking about something you said about Islam, how uh, back in the day in Harlem, you know, because they didn't have the sources they, you know, they wouldn't be able to refute, uh, you know, so and so uh, disciple of Elijah Muhammad, you know, saying whatever on the street corner. You know what I'm saying? Because they didn't have the sources. Uh, but, you know, obviously now we do. And I just think it's very interesting that, you know, so often, and I deal with this on my channel all the time, you have people who will put culture, you know what I'm saying, and the influence of culture either on par or even above scripture, you know what I'm saying, and God's truth in the world. And that's how you end up with different uh, belief systems like the Hebrew Israelites, the Moors, uh, the Nation of Islam, you know, where they're, they're, so, they're so concerned about culture you know, that they lose sight, they lose track of, of truth. Now, I'm of the perspective that as a, a function of God making us in his image and, and endowing us with these social properties, right, that we're able to relate to each other in ways that we create culture. I think it's that culture is actually a beautiful thing. But when it gets out of whack, you know what I'm saying, when we allow it to become the foundation of who we are, you know I'm saying, rather than just a feature of who we are, then we end up getting off base, such as, you know, again, that's, I think that's how the nation of Islam was able to flourish. Like you brought up the point, like, you know, they were supposed to be the belief system of, of Africans, you know, back in the 60s. They were saying, oh, no, this is what Africans was down with. You know, you, you, you know, worshiping the white man's religion and white Jesus and all that. But, you know, you know, bump that man, get rid of it, you know, follow uh, the honorable Elijah Muhammad and, you know, all this kind of stuff. But then when you find out that Islam has a heinous history mm -hmm. of slavery on the continent of Africa. I mean, we're talking about Africans being ca you know, castrated and kidnapped, taken to the Ottoman Empire. I mean, we're talking about a heinous strain. I mean, going back to Muhammad himself, like, you know, when you don't have those those sources and the access to that information in, you know, 1960 in Harlem, then you can't really combat that. But nowadays we can actually look and see what's really going on. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So I just kind of want to come back on that point. Yep, you are you are correct, sir. Um, <laughs> going back to uh, going back to vocab said, uh, uh, David is the white Aunt Esther. <laughs> it's crazy. I think he means that as an as an insult, but I think that is like the biggest compliment you could give me, right? I'm this super lovable, awesome, devout Christian. Right. <laughs> calling calling everyone a heathen. You old That's heathen. Weird. I remember. Uh, I remember Fred. He's classic, man. Huh? I remember uh, uh, George Foreman. Uh, George Foreman. This is after he. Uh, uh, this after he won the uh, heavyweight title. It was uh, was going to be on. You could tell because then all of a sudden, like one character becomes obsessed with George Foreman, and uh, mm -hmm. and so you could tell. Oh, George Foreman's about to be on the show, and so uh, Fred was talking. Uh, Fred was talking to. Uh, Fred was talking. To, I forget one of his friends. Great. Now, anyway, he uh, <clears throat> uh, he said George Foreman could beat anyone blindfolded, and his friend goes, uh, "What about King Kong?" And he goes, "Blindfolded." And he goes, uh, what, what about Godzilla? And he said, blindfolded. He goes, what about Aunt Esther? And Fred goes, 
<laughs> That'd be the only way he'd beat him is blindfolded. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> it's just funny. I remember this stuff from when I was a little. I, I remember this stuff from when I was a little kid watching this because it cracked me up so much. But uh, that's hilarious, bro. Oh, that's George Foreman was that dude, man. He was that dude, man. Oh, George, I George Foreman. I, 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 man, I wish he, I wish he had better boxing skills when he was young. Because I mean, you know, by the time you know when he fought Ali, he was just. He didn't have to have the best boxing skills because he was so powerful that just by oh, swinging yeah, his yeah. arms back and forth, I mean, I mean, I, I'm I was I'm a, I was a Joe Frazier guy. I love Joe Frazier, and he just oh yeah okay, okay he just okay. massacred Joe Frazier. He knocked him down like six times in two rounds. Every, every time he hit him, yes, Joe go Joe goes flying. And so you but, did that video the other day on um what's his what's his name um Tyson Fury Tyson Fury you know he beat the snot out of um, you know Dante Wilder you know and Dante's I mean he's known for his punching power. And, you know, so people were kind of, you know, they, they asked questions like, you know, where do you put, you know, Dante Wilder and, you know, in terms of power punchers, he's up there with Tyson, you got your foremans and there's a couple other guys as well. But, yeah, I, I always go back to this interview I saw with, um, with Hulk Hogan. This has nothing to do with anything. But, yeah, I got this interview with Hulk Hogan and apparently they were on set, you know, filming something. And so Hulk Hogan comes up and is like just, you know, goofing around with, with Foreman, you know, pretend, pretending to box him a little bit. He said that Jorman, like that George Foreman, like playfully hit him with a jab in his shoulder. He said, no lie, it felt like he broke his arm. Like, he, yep. like he, he really felt like he just he actually broke his arm. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, Hol- George is no joke, man. Hol- Hol- Holyfield, Hol- I mean, if you look at the old, he used to break, he used to break uh, heavy bags open, right? There's one, you know, you'd, yeah, you'd yeah. see, you'd see, uh, he, his trainer would be trying to hold a heavy bag, but he's hitting it so hard, you could tell it's really, it's like shocking, you know, it's like sending jolts of, of pain through his, through his trainer to even, to even hold on to that. But uh, uh, w- one of the best ever was, um, George Foreman, when he was when he was older, right after he fought Jerry Cooney, said uh, said um, I've only fought three genuine punchers in my entire life, and he named uh, uh, Jerry Cooney, um, hmm. Ronnie Lyle, and then one other guy, I forget who it was, but Ronnie Lyle, that was uh, he was another just insane punching power guy. I mean, if George Foreman is saying he said he said what it was like is he said they hit so hard that even if you completely block it, it hits you so hard that it shocks your entire body with with pain. Jeez. And uh, so, there, you know, that, that's got to be the same way it felt with uh, with uh, with with George Foreman. But he said, Ronnie, uh, he said, Ronnie, Lyle, if you watch uh, Foreman's fight with Ronnie, Lyle, these guys were beating each other's heads in with every single punch looked like it was a knockout blow. And these guys just kept going, I think, for like 11 rounds or something like that. But it was uh, that's crazy. man. It was, that's uh, crazy. Yeah, it was yeah. Uh, it was rough. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so I love uh, you. Yeah, we got it. Um, what did I put up here? Uh, Karugma. Oh yeah, he was just uh, Karugma's. Uh, uh, Karugma. Um, how long is the William Lane Craig uh, poll going on? And who's he? Who's he going up against? I don't know. Uh, who he's going last up I saw was James White. Uh, that's the last I saw. He was up against William James Lane White. Craig versus James White. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, my goodness. Yeah. That is. Uh, I mean, it was, it was uh, I, you know, last time I checked, it was it was a pretty landslide victory. It looked like in, in favor of James White, actually. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean he, J- James yeah. James has a as a huge like online presence, right? Whereas like you yeah. know, Craig, Craig Craig does more like you know, like, he goes around does you know tons of, of lectures and stuff, and and James does that too. But James has a bigger right. like like just, just you know, internet 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 presence because he's constantly doing live streams and stuff like that. So, yeah. well, particularly on Twitter too, he's, he's really active on Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. So, guys, I'm not. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But uh, uh, if you like William Lane Craig better, then go for William Lane Craig. If you like uh, James White better, then uh, go over there and vote for uh, vote for uh, James White. Wait, what did I say? Yeah, vote for whoever you like better. I think you said vote for. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah, I think you said it right. I think okay. you said it right. Um, yeah, I, was try- I have a problem that I'm reading at the same time that I'm, tr- I'm trying to talk about whatever I was just talking about, and uh, some people are great at that. Uh, yeah, I'm terrible at some, it. Some people that <laughs> some people are like I don't know like how many brains they have in their head, but they can like be reading comments and responding to something. Sa- Sa- yeah, it's like it's like me when we were in South Carolina reading at that church, man. I, I just zip right through it, you know. <laughs> Sa- <laughs> yeah, you know who's weird? Sam Inside Sam the- Shamoon. As dumb he as dumb as he is in every other way, and as uh, as <laughs> as horrible as his live streams are, and as much of an embarrassment as he is to uh, apologetics. Sam can actually be listening to multiple things at once, right? You'd be sitting there talking to him and he's like, he's like, uh, you know, giving, you know, just arguing with you and stuff like this. And all of a sudden he'll, he'll go, Hey, you, and then he'll respond to something. One of them said in his conversation, he'll be like, okay, yes, yeah, go, go to first Peter, look up, blah, blah. all right, back to you. Right. And so he, and he'll do that where he'll, he'll be typing an article on one topic while simultaneously like listening to a debate and he'll remember everything from the debate and still be, 
uh, typing the entire time. So, yeah. I do that, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I guess if I guess if uh, if your brain does not work in normal areas like getting along with people and living a normal life <laughs> and functioning in society, that your brain is just turbocharged to to deal with those <laughs> kinds of issues. You know what I mean? Is like, are you are you a Trekkie? Are you a, a Star Trek fan? Yeah. Uh, you, you know how like when, when there's always like this this fight scene, like the, the ship fight scene where they got to divert all the shields yeah, into yeah, like yeah. one area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The brain. Yeah, like yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All power to forward shields. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, um, somebody, somebody asked a question. Does David Wood ever age? Um, yeah. I, Are you a cyborg or something? I, I think what? some, but yeah, I don't know if I have any. Do I have any wrinkles or something? I don't know. Uh, yeah, probably a little. But yeah, it, it'll probably catch up with me. You know, a little when I get a little older. You live stream with like that filter, like you know how you do on your phone, where it kind of like you know keeps you younger or, or older. Like you got like this live feed filter. You thing. think you think I know how to use filters? <laughs> I don't know what the <laughs> heck I'm doing. <laughs> uh, all right, uh, all right. Let's go to the. Uh, I have a list here of all the uh, super chats. Let's make sure I got I got I got to all those. Oh, okay, cool. um, had a super cool, sticker cool. with a uh, looks like a some sort of blue bird. Holding up a thumbs up from Tochuku the Joku. Thank you for that super sticker. Um, Pitar, uh, Pitar Milik um, said, Zucker Knight claims Muhammad is in Isaiah 29. It would be less, ridic uh, less ridiculous if my seven-year-old cousin said this about the Little Mermaid, said that this is about the Little Mermaid. <laughs> uh, yeah, he is correct. Um, the, the claim is that Muhammad is... <laughs> because in, in Isaiah 29, it says that uh, you you know you will give the book, you will give the book to one who can read. I mean, you will give the scroll to one who can read, and he'll say, "I can't read it; it's sealed." And you will give the you will give the scroll to someone who can't read, and he'll say, "I can't read it; it's uh, because I, I can't I, I can't read." Right? Um, mm. This is talking about the rebellion of the pe of the people of Israel, and so this thing is uh, you know Isaiah is giving them this scroll about all the you know the judgments that are going to come upon them and stuff like this and he said these people are so hard-hearted that they'll make excuses for not accepting the word of god and then muslims go to mm. muslims go to go to verse 13 which says you'll give the scroll to to someone uh, who can't read and he will say i can't read and they take an incident of muhammad's life where the angel gabriel supposedly showed up to him told him read and he said i can't read and so they say, you see, this is talking about a prophet. When you look at it, it's not talking wow. about a prophet. It's talking about someone who stubbornly, who is stubbornly in rebellion against the word, against God, and stubbornly rebels against Him. And so, wow. if you're saying that's Muhammad, great. It's not about a prophet. That means he's in rebellion against 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 the true God. And so, great. If you think that's if you, nice. that's where you're going, Zachar Nike, Amen. I had fun with it. Is that the same dude? Now I could be getting them mixed up, but you you had a, that video with uh, William Lane Craig recently. Uh -huh. Where you were talking about that that apologist. Oh, yeah. Is that that same guy? Or? <laughs> no, 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 no. We're, we're talking about oh, okay. Zachary Nike. Zachary Nike is. I mean, Yusuf Estes is still massively popular as well, but uh, Zachary Nike's probably mm -hmm. probably the the most popular uh, Muslim apologist um, in gotcha. the world. No, but but notice if those that's the kind of argument that the top guys in the world um, are given, and so. Gosh, imagine if if those are the kinds of arguments we have. Uh, Google user uh, posted a picture of a flower and said, "For the ladies, keep looking fantastic." <laughs> what? Um, and then, the ladies. okay. And then Pitar said, uh, "If if uh, if Mahmoud equals Muhammad, then I'm Peter Pan." Pitar is the Serbian translation of Peter. By the way, Pitar, uh, it, it's spelled differently, so I'm assuming it's it's pronounced differently. Is it is it pronounced just like Peter, or is it? Uh, uh, is it pronounced uh, differently? Uh, You've been murdering his name this whole time, basically. Or? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, he says it's uh, Serbian. Um, Riaz Qureshi said a senior citizen marrying a preschooler. No way. So I guess they, that was a comment back on when we were talking about uh, the Muhammad, fact that we yeah. yeah we couldn't we couldn't believe the fact that it was it was it was happening. Uh, Cod LG Lisa look uh, ready made all with uh, super chats or super stickers. Uh, Pitar in there again, man. You're in there a lot. Uh, the Imam praising. Oh, I already read that one. Uh, hi from New Zealand. Sarah Nicholas said hi from New Zealand. God bless you both. Keep it up. I I heard that. Uh, I heard that New Zealand's actually doing pretty well. Although I don't understand how you wouldn't be doing even better in New Zealand. You're on an island, right? Very, very easy. To yeah, that's a good point. Right. Th that'd be that'd be a situation where I, I would probably do a full quarantine, right? Like, if you are showing up, if you are showing up 
from a plane. We understand that you got to come home. Uh, if you're showing up on a plane, then you have to go stay in this uh, hotel or something like that, this sterile, sterilized hotel in your own room until we test you, and then right. then you keep it, then you keep anyone from getting it ever. And then I would say, other than that, we're sticking it on our island and let the rest of the world figure things out. Um, yeah, I think that's perfectly legit. I mean, yeah. I mean, why not? You know what I'm saying? Uh, Fedar Fencer, King Charles. Uh, Fedar said. Uh, David, when Nabil was a Muslim, did did it trouble you thinking he thought he knew God but didn't? I have this worry with a Muslim friend of mine. Thanks. Um, no, it, it didn't. It didn't worry me that he thought he knew God. It does, you know. It does present a more more of an obstacle. I mean, on the one hand, you know, almost anyone you're talking to believes they're right about what they believe, right? Not a lot of people think, "Yep, yeah, I'm probably wrong about the main things I believe." Uh, so you know, in that sense, that that that's pretty normal. But kind of the more the the more they believe they have the truth, then the kind of rougher it is to get them to see anything from a different perspective. But the the cool thing about Muslims believing that they really have the truth and they really know God is pretty much everything they believe is based on something that is very very easy to refute. Right? This just never happens. They never they never hear they never hear the facts from their family or their imam or anyone they're around. And most, the vast majority of Christians that they ever come in contact with, or the vast majority of atheists that they ever come in contact with, uh, just aren't. They, they don't. They don't know how to respond to these kinds of things. But once you once you do learn those things, once you do learn how to refute their claims that the Quran's been perfectly preserved, that the Quran contains scientific miracles and things like that, once you're in that position, uh, it's very easy to start to start uh, to start ripping these things apart. And you take someone like Nabil, right? Hey. Oh, go ahead. Oh yeah, good. Oh, I was just going to say. No, I was going to say something too. I mean, I yeah, I think that um, I remember I was in college. My freshman year in college, there was this uh, this guy uh, Hannibal. He was like a RA. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So he was a couple years ahead, and like real cool dude. He, he was a Muslim. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I'm coming from a Christian background. I hadn't really interacted with folks from a, a whole lot of you know different worldviews and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And so this dude, he was, just like, he was just a really good dude, man. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? He was always kind to of people, all that kind of stuff. And so I'm thinking like, man, this guy's a Muslim. You know what I'm saying? But you know, he's he's a really nice dude. Like maybe maybe you know I'm tripping here. You know what I'm saying? Maybe there's something to this, this Islam thing. Um, but to your point, like, I kind of as I began studying more, I realized that, you know, sometimes we evaluate people, you know, based on standards that obviously, you know, God doesn't. You know what I'm saying like there are people who can, you know, who are straight up atheists who can do really good things for people mm-hmm. or whatever. But it's not about that. You know what I'm saying? It, yeah. It's not about, um, you know, even what somebody believes about themselves. I mean, the Bible talks about I, I mentioned earlier, you know, the heart of man is desperately wicked. Mm-hmm. You can deceive yourself in terms of your standing with God, obviously. You know, so at the end of the day, you know, there are just certain things that are true about the world. It is true that Jesus is Lord, rose from the grave, you know, that, you know, Yahweh is God. There's a Trinity. Those things are just true. And regardless of how we behave in this world or or what we believe about ourselves, at the end of the day, if we're not not aligning with the gospel, if we're out of step with the gospel, then we reject the salvation. You know, so I, I think sometimes we can evaluate people based on maybe maybe i don't know you know cultural societal standards mm-hmm. of good and whatever mm-hmm. um but it's you know it's really not about that god mm-hmm. has laid out you know his truth and whether we align with it or not that's that's really what we're going to be judged by so, yeah. yeah and uh it, I, I, this kind of connects to uh the comment earlier saying hey you know uh about you not letting black people yeah. think for themselves? Let that black people think for themselves. Don't talk to them like like you know they're yeah. you know like like you talk to any other person, right? Just leave them in their own category and and don't don't interact with them like that. Um, right. it, it, because I, I'm saying this, I'm I'm talking about a connection here because you know Muslims think that when you you criticize their views and you say, hey, you know, uh, you, you said that Muhammad is the greatest man ever. Actually, look at all this stuff he did. Um, you think that the Quran is the greatest book ever? Actually, look at all these problems. Um, mm-hmm. they think that when you're saying that you're insulting them and, uh, you know, treating them as bad and the people who are telling them, oh no, you, you know, your religion is wonderful and it's great and there are no problems with it. And it's, 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 you know, <laughs> it's the bee's knees the, the people who are telling that, telling them that are honoring them. And I just see it as, as the complete reverse, right? I mean, 
when I tell you, when I say, oh, you know, you just believe whatever you want, whatever makes you feel good, that's, it's like I'm saying to you, I do not believe that you are a person who's capable of rationally thinking, listening to my criticisms, working your way through them, and either refuting mm -hmm. my criticisms or acknowledging that, uh, you know, I have a point, right? I'm saying you're not that kind of, I'm, you know, when I don't want to address people like that, it seems like I'm degrading them, and I'm saying you're not in that category. When I, when right. I, when I tell a Muslim, hey, uh, you believe, you know, you claiming all these things, here are the refutations. To me, that's a higher view of them. There I'm, there I'm saying, hey, I believe you're capable of getting to the bottom of this. I believe you're capable of seeing through the nonsense that you've been taught. I believe that, yeah. that you are a person who ultimately is looking for the truth. Now, you could prove me wrong. You could prove that you're not interested in truth, right? But I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt at the beginning and assume the best, namely, that if you're wrong, you want to know it. And if mm -hmm. and that you want to know the truth about God and you want to know the truth about Jesus and you want to know the truth even about Muhammad and the Christ. Again, you can prove me wrong. You can prove me, no, you don't actually care about the truth at all. But uh, until I see that you really don't care about the truth, um, I'm going to assume the best and keep presenting facts to you. And, you know, it's just, it, again, the idea that that's mean or hateful is just is just so so weird to me. That's why, you, you know what, that reminds me, man, like real quick. So I'm, I'm a social worker by trade, you know, mm -hmm. and I used to work at like, it's basically kind of like a halfway house, if you will. It was, a, it was a center for kids who'd either run away or got into some trouble and they're trying to get right, things like that. And I'll never forget, man, there was this conversation between these two kids one time while I was on the shift. And one of them was like complaining about their mom. Like my mom makes me, you know, wash the dishes and she won't let me go out and do this. And you see all these complaints about, you know, these restrictions in our household. And one of the other kids, and I, I mean, I knew their backgrounds. They didn't know each other's backgrounds, but I knew the other, the, their backgrounds, each of them individually. And the other kid who I knew came from a, just a terrible situation. She like stopped. I was like, man, like, what are you complaining about? Yeah. I would love for my for my mom to correct me and and, and lay down the law on this because it should and it, it was crazy that it came I mean this kid was like twelve yeah. and she's like you know because it should, it says that your mom loves you you know she's she's willing to correct you and and be involved in your life that way she's not trying to be mean she's trying to tell you that she loves you and I think it's the same kind of concept like if I don't care nothing about you then yeah you can go ahead and you know live however you want believe however you want but you know if I really believe that Jesus has revealed himself. He's re you know, revealed himself. You know, God has revealed himself in the earth through Jesus Christ. And there are eternal implications, you know, to, you know, whether you reject the gospel or not. Then if I don't care about you, then yeah, I'm not going to say anything. But if I really love you, if I really care about you, then I'm going to be like that mom you mentioned earlier where you're telling that child to get, you know, get out of the street, you know, or whatever it may be. And even on top of that, I mean, not, not just eternal, but even in the here and now, I mean, your worldview has everything to do with how you function in the world. And the reality is when you really break down um, the, the, you know, Islam in terms of what Islam, if you follow it to its logical conclusions, like what it's really about, it's not just, okay, I believe what I believe, you believe what you believe. No, Islam is about establishing you know, that caliphate. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's about establishing Muslim rule in any given area. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's where you're trying to go with it, then yeah, I definitely have a problem with it mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's going to impact how I live, mm -hmm. how people around me live that, that I love and, and the individual that I'm dealing with. So there's both eternal and there's like right here and right now implications of the stuff. So of course, if we care about people, we got we got to address it. Mm -hmm. We got to address it. Yeah, and you know uh, who had a cool comment on this? Uh, you know, Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Penn. Uh, so Penn is a is a it was a diehard atheist. Uh, he used to have oh, a, yeah. he had a show with uh, uh, with Teller uh, where they would just blast. They would just blast the Bible and so on and say that you know the best way to make an atheist is to read the Bible and they'd just be making fun of it the entire time. But uh, Penn, you know, he would also just come on and, and just sort of uh, post a you know post a, a video and stuff like that on his on his channel and so on. He would say, you know, after a uh, you know, after after my show, a Christian came up to me afterwards and he said, uh, he said, uh, hey, here's a Bible in case you, you ever need one and want to want to read it. And he'd say, you know, I, I just thought that was cool. So here's a guy who clearly believes and he uh, he wanted me to know it. But uh, w what's cool about Penn is he said, if you're a Christian and you believe there's a heaven and you believe there's a hell, what kind of contempt must you have for me if you do not come up to me and tell me? Wow. And, he said, and he said, and he said, that's why, you know, as, 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 as much as as much as I rag on the Bible and stuff like that, he said, he said, he said, I have much more respect for people who come up and tell me, um, tell right. me, tell me why, you know, why I should believe this rather than, you know, than, than for the people who just walk by and are, mm. are worried about my feelings and so on. So, 
uh, anyway, it's cool. That's deep. It's cool. That's deep. Cool perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this stuff really matters, man. I mean, it, it matters, like I said. I mean, both eternally and here and now. Actually, now I think about it, I was I was tripping because I was watching your debate that you had with Matt, Matt uh, Dillon Hunter the other day, and you know, <laughs> uh, you know. Anyway, I'm, I'm gonna resist you know some of my comments here, but uh, you know, he he was talking about his framework for morality. He's like, well, yeah, you know, we we can, you know, if you agree that you know there's you know these things that we want to accomplish, and you know, if you don't agree that you don't have a moral obligation, he's kind of. He's just real kind of flowery and flimsy with it. I'm like, fam, like, have you, have you interacted with people of, of these differing worldviews? Have, yeah. have you really sat down and talked with a Muslim in terms of like what it is that they agree upon Im- amongst you know other Muslims in terms of what they want for the world? Like this la di da, everybody come together in the name of reason, and we're all going to agree <laughs> on human flourishing. It's it's a pipe dream, man. Yeah, it's, it's a uh, pipe dream. It's um, I mean. R- the whole time, the whole time. I mean, I'm thinking along the same lines that you are, but but I mean, I said it in my opening statement. I said, when when a Christian makes a moral claim, atheists are ready to dial up their skepticism to ten and prove yeah. this, prove this conclusively that we have this moral obligation. That there's you know, there's this you know, prove it, prove it, yeah. or, right, or, right. or 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 it's nonsense until you give us all this proof. And then they'll then they'll base their you know their entire moral framework. Human beings just seek well being, and you know we can sit down and you know come up with rules and figure out well being. And even if we're just completely selfish, then we wouldn't want to do anything wrong because you know we'd we'd want a great world. And even if we could steal something, we wouldn't. And and it's like you guys clearly are not applying any level of skepticism to these claims. It's like it's more like let me say anything that is different from your view, and right. I will not subject it to the slightest bit of criticism or scrutiny. I'll just claim it, and that's that's good enough for me. And and really, yeah, this, yeah. this is this isn't just a Dillahunty problem. It's a certain kind of atheist problem, right? So I'm not saying that right. that all that all atheists are like that. I know I know atheists who are intellectual, intellectually brutal. I mean, they're 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 just shredding arguments trying to get to the truth and so on. But gotcha, but gotcha. I mean I mean. You just see guys and they say, we're skeptics and extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. We're skeptics, we're skeptics, we're skeptics. <laughs> and then, right. you know, so you, you, you start making a, a, you know, let's say Kalam cosmological argument and say, you know, whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And you start, you know, looking into what kind of cause it has to be. And then they're like, sure. oh, well, how do you know the universe began to exist? Oh, you can prove it philosophically and mathematically and scientifically. But that's not enough because I can be super skeptical of that and deny all that. And oh, you're going to claim that, you know, <laughs> right, right, gonna, right, and right. they become and you're saying that whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Ha, prove that. How, how, how do I know that something just can't come out of nothing? Right. And they become like these like insanely yes extreme skeptics but then you say okay what's your response to fine-tuning oh there's a multiverse out there there's this infinite array of alternative universes and it's uh, you know so ours ours somehow popped out of that really what okay that sounds like an extraordinary claim to me what's your extraordinary evidence i saw it in a youtube video and that that's your evidence right or life can form from non-life okay right you got scientists in all these labs they're 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 working how how do you actually get from life to non-life it clearly it clearly happened because we're here, right? Because we, yeah, yeah, the, the puddle analogy yeah, starts yeah, coming yeah, up, and then you got yeah. all these. Kind of, my tenth, yeah, my yeah. tenth grade biology teacher said, you know, hey, you, you got the the cosmic right. soup there, and it mixed together, and something happened, and bam, right? Really, right. That, that's your level of skepticism with something like life can form out of now. That's your level of skepticism. So it's well, a, yeah, it's, I mean, life, rationality on yeah. top of that. I mean, it's not that we're just like these living beings. We got the ability to reason. I mean, somehow that just kind of fell into place. I mean, there's all these different factors. But I mean, but to your point though, I mean, it's like their skepticism. They're, they're not consistent with their skepticism. You know yeah, I, I agree with yeah. You. And, and now, and, obviously, again, I mean, that's that's not everybody. Yeah, you know, but I I think it's it's more common. You know, particularly in this. Uh, this den of of you know evil I'm saying called the internet i mean it just you know, they just kind of come out of the woodworks but but what trips me out though is you know when you present this well reasoned case now, now here's my thing i don't know any apologists that would say that okay well i'm going to give you the kalam and you're going to have no choice but to bow your knee to the cross like right now you know i'm saying that like i don't know any apologists who presents evidence for God's existence in that manner. The reality is, is that, oh, we're saying, hey, look, you know, there's a reasonable case that can be made. Like, you don't have to, you, you know, we're not Looney Tunes out here. You know, we're not crazy and just touchy-feely, you know, making our way through the world and believing in Jesus. No, here's a reasonable case for Christ here. You know what I'm saying? And if you choose after, you know, after hearing that case, if you choose to reject God, then, well, that's 
that's that that is what it is. You know what I'm saying God's not going to re- remove your ability to to reject him just because I gave you the kalam. You know mm-hmm. It's like, oh, well, he gave those three those those three steps. He gave him that syllogism, bam, you know, he's, he's got to convert now. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, it, and what's what, I mean, I think this is something that people need. That's why I pulled out a skeptometer in, uh, in, in the debate is I, I don't, I, I think this yeah. needs to be emphasized way more than it is because you've got all these atheists out there like Richard Dawkins and all these other guys and they're going around saying, just give us the evidence, just show us the evidence. And then uh, I haven't, I haven't, I, I should probably post this soon. But I have, an, I have an interview with uh, Richard Dawkins where he was asked, what if God did exist, what evidence could he give you that, that he exists? Um, and Dawkins said, well, you know, years ago I would have said that, you know, if I hear some voice, Richard Dawkins, believe in me, blah, blah, blah. He said, yeah, uh, yeah. I said, I thought, you know, I thought that would convince me. But then I realized if that happened, uh, I would just think that I'm hallucinating, right? So, and, <laughs> and, and they, him and him and Peter Bogosian, who, Peter Bogosian is the guy who like made an made a, a manual for creating atheists or something like that. Yeah, yeah, he's the, uh, it was the um, what's that system he calls it? Um, I know Cameron does stuff on it all the time. Um yeah, I'm drawing a blank now. He's, he's, I know he wrote a whole book on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and, but yeah. It's, it's interesting because Peter Bogosian ended up inter, uh, uh, agreeing with Dawkins, but they kept going back and forth thinking what... And they got to the point where they're saying, even if I walked outside and there's a message written out in the stars, you know, Richard Dawkins, believe in me, I would, I would just conclude that there must be powerful aliens who are trying to trick me. And you start realizing... Right. This guy is admitting that there is absolutely no evidence that he wouldn't explain away, right? Like if, if God showed up and started blasting lightning bolts... He would just say, wow, powerful aliens are trying to trick me. Like, there's nothing. Right. P- Peter, there's nothing. At- Peter Atkins is even more extreme. Right? He's he's a, he's a he's a Oxford atheist chemist, and uh, he's debated Craig before. But, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. I know yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he said, if I died and I found myself standing in front of St. Peter and the pearly gates, I'm still not going to believe. I'm going to think this is some sort of insane delusion or something like that, even, even after my death. I'm not going to believe. And so, oh, actually, you know, actually, that sounds like. Um, yeah, now, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to jump too far here, but I, I remember you quoted some guy. I want to say it was a, a Muslim cleric or something like that who said that even if he had one foot in heaven, oh, yeah, he yeah, still yeah. wouldn't believe that he was there because. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> because no, that, that, uh, that was Abu. That was Abu Bakr. That was Abu Bakr, Muhammad's, okay, okay, Muhammad's yeah. best friend. That's Aisha's dad. That's Aisha's dad, Abu, oh, Abu Bakr. Oh, yeah. there you go. And he's the yeah. first. Uh, he's the first caliph. He's the first ruler after after Muhammad. But yeah, so I mean, what what you're finding out is all these guys who are going around saying, "Show me the evidence." I just go over the evidence point. They've constructed an ideology that is impervious to evidence, right? That's why they can say you right. can give them the Kalam cosmological argument or the argument from fine tuning or biological design. You can give them all this evidence. There's and they just say it's no evidence at all. There's no evidence. You, you you've shown me no evidence. They can say it's no evidence because they've constructed a methodology that is impervious right. to evidence. And just just to kind of illustrate what that what that looks like, right? Everyone imagine. Let's pretend I'm. A metaphysical solipsist, right? A metaphysical solipsist is someone who believes. A metaphysical solipsist is the a person who believes he's the only thing that exists, right? So if I I was convinced that I'm the only thing that exists, right? There's some sort of I'm some sort of consciousness that is all that exists, and there's nothing else that exists anywhere else. But sort of to keep myself entertained, I sort of mm-hmm. in, I sort of invent this world around me in my imagination, kind of like if you're dreaming, you, just, you know, you, you invent things that happen, right? But they they believe you know on a much bigger scale. Uh, right. You know, I'm, I'm all that exists, and all this is is made to you know to keep myself occupied because there's nothing else for all eternity, and so I, I invent all this world. Now, it, now imagine such a person believes that, and he says, "Okay, if you think I'm wrong about meta- metaphysical solipsism, prove that prove to me that I'm wrong." There's nothing you can say. There, no, there, no. there is no evidence. Anything you say to give him an argument, he he views it as a figment of his imagination. So there right. is notice this every atheist in the world would say this guy's this guy's this guy has a ridiculous worldview. But guess what? Mm-hmm. You couldn't refute it because he's constructed it in such a way that any evidence against him would be reinterpreted as just the figment of his own imagination. Well, you've got now mm-hmm. you've got Dawkins and Co. saying they've done that, but just on a bigger scale, right? The natural world. The natural world right. is all that exists. And any evidence that could possibly given be given for something beyond the natural world, they would simply reinterpret as something caused by something within the natural world and so they're doing mm-hmm. the same thing and I, I just think this needs to be pointed out it's uh well i mean actually i mean to, i mean to your point this and actually what you're describing is not just like a you know atheist versus the bible type of a problem mm-hmm. i mean like when you look at epistem the field of epistemology right much of it has to do with how can we put together a framework whereby we can say we know x y and z but, you know, A, we're not opening the door so wide that people can affirm crazy claims and get away with it. 
But at the same time, we're not closing the window so small, you know, that we're not allowing like legitimate inferences and observations about the world to be held with some level of credibility. I mean, that's that's a huge discussion in, in, in um, you know, the field of epistemology in general. And so what you're describing with Dawkins and, and uh, Matt Dillahunty, I would describe him mean, as it's bad epistemology mm-hmm. at the end of the day. You know what I'm saying is, is that they've they've waited. Uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like, the, you know, it's like playing with weighted dice. You know what I'm saying? Uh, from an epistemological, epistemological, epistemological standpoint, you know, where they're not really. Um, they're, I, I feel like they're letting their, their biases show at the mm-hmm. end of the day. You're just saying. You know, I don't care what you have to say. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to believe regardless. Yeah. And then I'm going to be snarky about it in the process. I mean, that's that's really what it, a lot of it comes down to. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And the, the, the reason I want to really drive this point home in some videos is uh, lots of people let other people do some of their investigation and higher level thinking for them. In other words, most people who are working, they don't have time to, to go through volumes on quantum physics or you know studying the 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 universe they don't have time to learn all of cosmology or Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have time to learn they don't have time to spend years really going through the evidence for the resurrection they can learn that they can learn the basics um but they don't have time to really just you know read the, the the tons and tons of literature so they rely on you know gary habermas to do that for them or you know if it's cosmology sure. they'll rely on you know i'm talking about christians now they rely on william lane craig to do that for them but but different groups right like like muslims they're they're relying on Zucker Knight to do their research for them, which is just hilarious. Because right, right, right. uh, as far as I can tell, Zucker Knight has no clue what he's talking about. So that's the sad. <laughs> that's the sad situation. But lots of atheists, lots of atheists, they're leaving a lot of their wrestling with Christian issues in the hands of like Richard Dawkins and things like that, right? So they, mm. think, so in other words, they're thinking if you bring up an argument and they can't answer it, they're thinking, yeah, but Richard Dawkins could do it, or this mm. guy, this guy could. And what's what's amazing to me is you get to the people that they've entrusted to do their 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 thinking for them and it's guys who are at the end of now they're they're finally acknowledging that ah, doesn't matter what the evidence is i would never believe it anyway so so <laughs> notice you, you can come you right, can right. you can come up with a kind of rule here right there's a kind of rule here uh it goes something like this um richard dawkins rejecting an argument saying ha this is a bad argument um i i, I reject it that tells you absolutely nothing about whether the argument is good or bad because Richard Dawkins is going to reject it either way. If it's a if it's a Gross. brilliant if it's a brilliant airtight argument for the existence of God, Dawkins is going to reject it and say it's no evidence at all. But if it's a really right. if it's a garbage argument for the existence of God, Richard Dawkins is still going to uh is still going to uh, reject it. So either way, Richard Dawkins is going to right. reject it. Richard Dawkins dismissing arguments tells you nothing, atheists. So you need right. you need to actually start looking into them yourself because that guy can't be trusted. Well, yeah. And to your point, I mean, I, I think that, and now this is actually good, you know, cuts both ways. I mean, I, I, like I'm very suspicious of people mm-hmm. on whether it be the atheists or whether it be, you know, Christians who are like, Oh, well, there's just no good arguments for the other side. There's just no, there's nothing to be grappled with over there. I mean, like even some of our tough, you know, sharpest guys, whether it be William Lane Craig, I'm thinking about Swinburne, I mean, all these guys, I mean, they're like, yeah. I mean, they're they're wrestling with real stuff. I mean, they you know they're, they're working their way through these arguments for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying it's because it's something that needs to be grappled with. You know, so when I come across the atheist, it's like, oh, there's just no evidence. There's just nothing that you guys have on your side of the coin. I'm like, okay, so that means you're you're probably not really either reading the best material on this subject if you're reading it all, or you're really you're just not really taking this seriously. You know, and if you and I know we're not going we're not doing like a review of, of Dylan Honey here, but if if you don't mind, I'm just. I'm just I, I gotta get because this is like one of my pet peeves. I, mean, I was watching this, the, the y'all's debate the other day, and one thing that just ticks me off is where you know somebody like Adila Honey. I've seen him do this several times. I want to say is where they basically allege that you've assaulted a straw man, but you really haven't assaulted a straw man. Like yeah. you kept making this distinction yeah. between atheism and secular humanism, which obviously they're two different things. And he's like, well, you you keep talking about atheism, but I'm defending secular humanism. But the reality is, if you understand the atheistic worldview, if you understand it to be the the denial of the proposition that God exists, you know what I'm saying they, you mm-hmm. do not believe that God exists. Mm-hmm. If that's an overarching worldview, and secular humanism is somewhere down here, mm-hmm. and the fact of the matter is, for every proposition, there's going to be you know numerous other there's going to be a number of different implications that you can get from that proposition. So if you mm-hmm. say that God does not exist, mm-hmm. if you hold that position, there are implications of that. Yep. And some of those implications, 
intersect with what you would affirm as a secular humanist. So mm-hmm. it's totally appropriate yeah. to address atheism in the context of, of you know, uh, making a critique of his secular humanism. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Oh, like, and, they, they, and, they, and, and, uh, irritating. and, uh, I mean, really, if, if, if my sort of side of the issue is God, well, atheism is the negation of that, right? So right. if I'm saying, hey, my worldview gives us moral realism, uh, the alternative, atheism, doesn't give us moral realism, and here's here are the implications of that, and here's how it will uh, it will undermine your worldview. I think it's just, I I don't know. It, it seems like they just start yelling straw man whenever you either quote them or you go with the implications of anything. And I, it seems like his fans or respond to what he just said it, five seconds before. Yeah, yeah, uh, or or repeat repeat what he said. Right. <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Any of that. Any of that's a straw man. Which which is funny because I'll probably end up making videos about this. I have never seen anyone straw man Christianity as much as Dillahunty, right? I I I, had, I, had no, I I have not followed him at all. I think I watched one video clip of him a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a part of something he said in a, in a debate with with Mike Lacona. Uh, I can't think of anything else. So I I, I I haven't been following him until you know just now. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, just looking at the comments he makes, uh, if you know, once you say God did it, up you stop. You just stop. That's all reasoning stops, and you say, okay, we're we're done. We're done reasoning. And I'm thinking. Uh, once again, what planet do you live on, right? Right. I mean, Nicholas Copernicus believed God did it. That didn't stop him from going and sitting here down doing all the mathematics of trying to come up with a better model of the universe. Um, sure. Galileo believed God did it. Uh, yeah, Johannes mm-hmm. Kepler believed God did it. New- all these got every figure of the scientific revolution, every last one. From, this is, just so everyone knows, the, the scientific revolution is roughly the period from uh, Nicholas Copernicus down to Isaac Newton. When Isaac Newton comes up with his, you know, fig, you know, applying all the, you know, all, all these laws to the entire universe, right. uh, that's the period of the scientific revolution. With zero exceptions, every last one of these figures of the entire scientific revolution believe that God did it, and that did not stop them from trying to figure it all out. In fact, if you look at their quotations. That was the driving force. They believe that right. they're created in the image of God and that this has an intellectual component. And they believe that they're actually performing a kind of worship by trying to understand how God did it. And so it's the driving force. And you've got someone like Dillahunty saying, nope, once you believe God did it, that stops it all. And so the entire scientific revolution refutes everything he says, and it doesn't matter. Right? It just doesn't matter. And so Notice, yeah. notice I mean, the, the, the point. The point yeah, the point here oh, is good. that is a massive straw man, right? This is what you. This is what Christians do. This would be. This would be like me coming to coming to uh, atheists. Imagine, imagine I walked up to, uh, to. Imagine I was talking with Adam, and you overheard our conversation. I said, "You know what atheists do? As soon as a person becomes an atheist, he just sits around and says everything's meaningless, and he sits in his room until he dies because he concludes that everything's meaningless. That's what atheists do." You guys would say, what is wrong with you? You are so idiotic. Why would you make right. a claim like that? You know we don't do that. Why would you say it, right? But it, right. guys, that's exactly how we feel when you've got when you say, nope. Once you say God did it, you stop all reasoning, you stop all investigation. It's you're you're completely proven wrong by the entire history of the last two thousand years, and it doesn't stop you from making it. Which means, once again. Your claims are just impervious to evidence, and 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 and, and the real thing here, Adam, that, that that I find absolutely hilarious. These are the guys who claim we're skeptics. Nothing gets inside these brains except what's proven true. And yet, you start looking at the claims they made, and all of their claims that they're claiming are have been proven false, and they just don't care. So they don't care about reality. They don't care about facts. It's not. It's not really about. It's not really about it's atheism. Not, it's, not about it's about it. certain. It's about certain kind. Of uh, of atheists. How do we get down this rabbit trail? Anyway, what you you said you want to say something? Know, man, but, yeah, actually, well, I was going to just kind of add to your point, though. I mean, like, so for somebody, and I'm not trying to beat up on Dylan. Honey, so actually, I'll, I'll take this off of him. But for individuals, you know, like that, you know, I, well, I, I can see. Let's say you just, you know, you just got an atheism like yesterday, and you say you joined some Facebook forum, and a bunch of people are ranting against Christianity, and you know, you you kind of absorb that, and so you got this attitude, like, oh yeah, those dumb Christians, they don't believe, you know, they they don't follow. You know the scientific method. You know, you know, whatever. I'm saying, I, I, you know, I get that. I'm saying you don't know any better. But if you've been around the block for a yeah. while, if you've debated several different well-versed Christians, like people who who can not, you know, say a thing about the Bible and just deal with you on know, philosophical grounds alone, you know, what I'm saying, and demonstrate the existence of God, and you've been down this road a thousand times, then at some point, I have to say that it's kind of just disrespectful 
for you to continue to characterize people as like these mindless, you know, non-critical thinking, you know, Bible zombies or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, at some point, it's, it's like you're just making a decision to not acknowledge, you know, that, hey, you know, we really are bringing something to the table you know that's that's worth grappling with here on on the intellectual on intellectual grounds, you know. But you know, so I, I don't. I just I just want to throw that in there, man. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how we got down that road. I'm, I'm sure it's your fault, though. I'm sure it had nothing to do yeah. with me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we've been going a long time. We definitely want to wrap up before ten. So uh, let's uh, let me burn through the rest of these um, super chats and super stickers real quick. Um, let's see. Uh, where'd that comment go? Um, Ada. Ada says, uh, hey, David and Adam, are all your stores empty, too, because of the coronavirus? Um, no, I mean, not, well, not like completely empty. I mean, uh, bread's a little tough, you know, to come by. Um, of course, toilet paper. I don't know what it is about toilet paper. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel like, I mean, there, there's been like other crises to go on. And I mean, I, I could be wrong, but. Yeah, I would not have expected that one, but that was. I I think what start. I think what start. I think a few people are like, oh, we got to get all the toilet paper, but that set everyone else into a panic, right? right. Like, oh, I'm, 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 I, I, everyone's buying up all the toilet paper. I have to get on this too, and then it caused like mass hysteria. Yeah, I mean, I, I bought some too. Actually, I mean, I, yeah. I did the same thing. I was like, oh snap! Like yeah. maybe it's, <laughs> like, it'll yeah, buy, like maybe maybe that's why. Like I, I get the hand sanitizer. I get wanting to stock up on hand sanitizer. Yeah, yeah, if you're yeah. like, I'm going to be using this every day, everywhere I go. Uh, I get that, uh, but yeah. So as far as as far as I've I've seen, yeah, toilet paper, hand sanitizer, sometimes paper towels. Um, other than that, it's uh, th- things are pretty pretty well stocked. Um, P. Hubinet said, "Hey guys, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. Also, I've been doing street ministry for years, but in the past few weeks, I can tell you that sharing the gospel is like shooting fish in a barrel. Just saying. So, <laughs> okay. find, right. finding uh, street evangelism easy." Um, Oh, street epistemology. That's what I was trying to uh, say. I was, I was I was struggling to try to come up with it. With uh, you mentioned uh, Bogosian, I think it's street oh, yeah, epistemology. Oh yeah, 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 that's, yeah. That's a system. Yeah. Um, uh, amateur amateur ant says uh, everybody is kung fu fighting. Lol. Insert the beats. Uh, by the way, China made this bioweapon and it backfired. It came from Wuhan, where they have a lab. I don't know about I don't know about that, but uh, um, yeah. you said you're big on conspiracy theories. Well, I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I did entertain, you know, <laughs> this idea that maybe it's man-made. I don't think that it is. Again, and and that's partly because when I look back at human history, I mean, this is, I mean, we're what we're experiencing is hasn't happened in a while. You know what I mean? But it's not really anything unusual. I mean, pandemics happen. You know what I'm saying? Uh, epidemics happen. So I'm I'm trying to keep my conspiracy side under wraps. Um, the synagogue said. Uh... David, uh, where would one approach you with a debate offer? I have a Muslim gentleman, Nadir Ahmed, who wants to debate you, and I'd like to host, but this is the only way I know to reach you. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if you know the history of Nadir Ahmed, um, but... No, you got me, yeah. No, 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 I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about... <laughs> um, oh, oh, okay. Nadir uh, comes out of nowhere every few years, and then he says everyone's scared of him, everyone's running from him, he can destroy everyone. And we ignore him for a while, and then we finally get sick of it, and then we debate him and crush him, and then he disappears for for a few years, and then all of a sudden he'll come out again. So the the last wave of Nadir Ahmed, I did two debates with him, and uh, they were both in a church, and one of them was on his Islam or religion of peace, and I walked on afterwards, and the the pastor there he goes, it was like you were clubbing a baby seal up there, man. We started feeling just <laughs> bad for the guy that you're just, I mean, you're just sitting there clubbing him and clubbing him and clubbing him and clubbing him. Right. And so... <laughs> just putting him out um, of his misery. Yeah, yeah. The, the idea that we should be giving Nadir Ahmed attention, I don't know, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to have to be, there's going to have to be a good reason for it. Like some organization wants to choose him as their champion so that it's, because the problem with Nadir is you can completely destroy Nadir and then everyone says, what? We don't care about him. And so, what what did you mm-hmm. what did you accomplish? So, if some organization okay. wants to come and say Nadir is our champion, I'd be I'd be happy to uh, happy to oblige there. Uh, other than hey, that, I, I, like uh, you, I, saw, I like seeing you get into your uh, anti atheism bag, man. I, I thought that was a good debate. I, I like seeing you in that that mode, man. I hope, you know, you got any more th- any more like that, you know, coming up or anything you, you might be doing with that? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I'm I'm about to debate uh, the apostate prophet. We're gonna have a debate on on. Oh yeah, on yeah, that. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, I, I'm kind of gonna I'm kind of gonna stick to the moral argument for a while and pointing out problems uh, with the atheist responses and so on, and uh, basically take on all challengers and things like that for a little while and see how that goes. And uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what happens. Can um, I do a shameless plug with that or what's that? Can I do a shameless plug on, on that note? Do all the plugs you want. 
Yeah, cool. I, I just I just did a uh, um, shout, well, shout out to everybody who's involved in the Cyber City Conference put on by Vocab Malone last week. And so actually, I did I just did a session on my channel, True Idea Apologetics, on the problem with quote black atheism. You know, what I'm saying um, atheism uh, in the African American context kind of takes on certain cultural flavorings, and it's actually gaining some traction. And so I basically gave uh, like five different versions, excuse me, four different versions of the the moral argument. And also address the, the argument for reason as well. You know what I'm saying, and, and just basically showed how a you can you can de- demonstrate God's existence from the moral argument, but also how the lack of um, or basically atheism's atheistic pers- an atheistic perspective ha- is is not able to account for morality and kind of mm-hmm. how that would negatively play out, you know, particularly in the African American mm-hmm. context. So you know, people might want to check that out. <coughs> and and uh, actually, you have a <clears throat> you have a good book chapter on that where yeah, you point out that for for atheists who are saying, oh, because of you know the history of slavery in America, and they're pointing to all these injustices and saying, therefore, there's no God, you then yeah. you then lose the moral framework for pointing out that all those things are are, hor- are horrible and wrong. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, if you were yeah. if you were if you were if you had a Dawkins frame of mind where we're machines for propagating DNA, how in, mm-hmm. how in the world do you say it's wrong to enslave another another person? I mean, you could say it, you can say it, but how do you mm-hmm. actually defend it? I mean, I have a machine for making toast uh you wouldn't say that i shouldn't i i, I can't own that um i have right. a, i have an i have another machine for propagating dna that's a dog right a dog is a machine for propagating dna we don't have a problem with me owning that uh we you know there's another machine uh for propagating dna it's a cow you have no problem with me killing and eating that i mean some people would mm-hmm. uh but mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. most people don't uh and so you take the cow and you kill the cow and you eat the cow well, there's this other machine for propagating DNA, and it's the smarter than the cow, and therefore you're just not allowed to to do it. There's no base. There's no basis for that within within atheism, and so. Um, no, no, no. no. Yeah. As, as a matter of fact, I mean, just you know, real quick. I mean, if, if depending on which way you want to go with it, if you subscribe to say like maybe um, someone like a Sam Harris kind of view, mm-hmm. or I'm, I'm not even gonna put it on him, but like if you believe that morality is grounded somehow in, in evolution or something like that. You know, then the reality is, if you look at human history, you know, um, and just, you know, well, actually, not just human history, just natural selection. I mean, the story of natural selection is survival of the fittest. You know what I'm saying, I mean, you know, survival is the highest ethic. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So if you're exerting your power over somebody else to, you know, gain some sort of a survival advantage, then you've actually acted in accord with your evolutionary programming. So really, on for anybody who believes that the evolution is the grounding for morality, then actually slavery was right. You know, that's that's what you would expect on that kind of a framework. You know what I'm saying? Those are the kinds of moral absurdities that you end up with when you start getting off kilter with the with the moral framework. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the classic the classic uh the classic saying is nature is red in tooth and nail, right? It's a, it's a nature is a big bloodbath. Yeah. So if yeah. uh if that's what if that's what we are and that's where we come from, guys, you know, we can we can sit down and we can agree to things and we can agree to certain, you know, things that we're gonna live by to make our lives easier and um yeah but there's there's nothing remotely resembling any sort of objective moral obligation it's just it's just not there and so just just stop acting like you you can really make these kinds of moral claims um all right let's uh we want to be off in a couple minutes so let's uh okay uh, last couple um um uh jacob ellinger said just a reminder the governor of michigan has banned the cure for coronavirus that would be odd because uh, I'm the, I didn't know there was a cure for coronavirus, so take a closer look at that. Um, M, uh, MJ Jackson said, what's good, people? Uh, Abiogenesis Zero Proof said, please uh, address how atheism leads to social Darwinism. Uh, yeah, that might need to actually do an entire show on something like that, but that is a very uh, interesting topic on, on uh, implications of different worldviews. So I'd be happy to cover that in a, uh, in a live stream. Uh, and Mr. Phil Fox said, ha ha. Love the jihadi tears. Adam, is there a need to have subgroups like black atheism, black church, or should we just view each other as saved and unsaved? That's a good question. As a matter of fact, I um, there's, there's a gentleman named Dr. Umar Johnson. I did a response to him kind of on, along the same lines. Now, I don't want to spend too much time. Guys. It was like a, like a three-hour show yep. that I did on it, you know what I'm saying? But in short, um, I believe that... Um, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, going back to true idea, I believe that the foundation of who we are is that we're made in the image of God. And I think you have a reiter- reiteration of that, you know, from a covenantal standpoint, you know, when you come in, into, uh, when you come to Christ. 
so, you know, the foundation of who we are is, is who we are in God, who we are in Christ. With that being said, I do believe that God has, has created us with certain capacities to relate to one another in ways that tend toward forming cultures and nations and things of that nature. So like, even if, let's say the fall of man never happened, you know I'm saying just basically, you know, if you had two different groups who were, you know, geographically apart from one another, they're going to form cultures. They're going to be different. You know what I'm saying? They're going to eat different foods and listen to different music. I think that's just, I think that's part of God's um, artist, artist side, if you will. So in other, so I said that to say, I don't think that God has a problem you know, with people referring to one another based upon some of these subcategories, ethnicity, even in the scriptures. I mean, just to be, you know, completely explicit about it, just real quick. I mean, you have passages in Acts where it refers to the, the Gentile Christians and the Gentile Jews and the, the those who were of the, you know, of the circumcision or something, you know, things of that nature. And then Paul himself says that, you know, he identified, he said, I would, I would rather be accursed for my brethren in the flesh, you know, referring to the Jews. I mean, so he still has some sort of, you know, connection you know, with, um, you know, his ethnic heritage. So mm -hmm. I don't think there's anything wrong with ethnic heritage. I don't think, I think you know, it's, it's a beautiful thing and there's nothing wrong with us uh, acknowledging that as long as we don't make, have a feature of who we are mm -hmm. and, and make it the foundation of who we are, which mm -hmm. is, you know, that we're made in the image of God. I think that's the key. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and I, I would agree. I mean, I, I'm thinking there is a, a different category of faith. If, if you're, if you're, main arguments or your main reasoning as far as atheism is based on certain experiences of the black community that's kind of sure. different that's kind of different from what you know someone like Dawkins is is addressing so right if you're if you're if it's kind of grounded in other issues then in order to clarify what you're talking about you might want that subcategory now to be clear I think right. you could have a black atheist whose view is not really what 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 you're talking about is black atheism, right? He might he might sure. he might be exactly parallel to sure. Richard Dawkins or something like that. But there is a sort of, and I think this could I think this is probably true of various groups in the world that they can have. I I think you could be a woman and and have kind of have kind of different yeah. reasons for for different kinds of objections against theism and Christianity than other. And so, you know, you have like like in, in, in philosophy, there's a category called feminist philosophy. Right. Mm, mm -hmm, and it, and, mm -hmm. and at, fir at first, uh, lots I'm going to say lots of the guy philosophers were kind of making fun of it. Right. Like, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. what is what is feminist philosophy? But I actually had a feminist philosopher uh, who was a professor of mine actually explain it. She's like, w women have historically um, a sort of different take on things. Guys are out doing things and we're, we're, we're seeing things from a different perspective and you know we give birth and we have these di different kinds of issues and different sort of focuses. And so we're looking at things from a different perspective. And so how do these things play out and how we view the world and things like that? And I'm like, oh, well, that, that actually makes sense, right? Right, so, right, right, yeah. absolutely. You guys give like a 30 second example, like, you know, we, since we're talking about the moral argument. So like with the moral argument, you know, typically when people teach it, you know, I'll just give you the Craig version, you know, if God does not exist, objective moral values and duties don't exist, you know, the premise to objective moral values and duties do exist. Therefore, God exists. Like a lot of times when people get to the second premise, you know, of, you know, uh, objective moral values, you know, do exist and, 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 and uh, obligation do exist. You know, often they'll appeal to things like, well, you know, obviously the Holocaust was wrong or obviously, you know, uh, murdering babies for fun is, is wrong. You know, things of, of that nature. Well, in our context, you know, it's, you know, usually I find it helpful to use examples like obviously chattel slavery on the basis of race was wrong. You know, that's something that in the same way that talking about the Holocaust will get mileage and help people to understand that the second premise of the of the moral argument, you know, in other contexts, it, it helps to mention things that are, are culturally, you know, like resonant. It really resonates with people in terms of that their historical heritage, you know. So there's just different ways that you can contextualize the same arguments, you know, and then help people to see, um, you know, uh, things from a through a different lens, you know. So it's just, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we are running out of time, but uh, fortunately, I uh, can, can uh, give shout out to these last few um, Super Chat Super Stickers. We have Liza J. We have uh, Lisa Look, uh, both with the Super Stickers. We have C Punish in the Super Chat. Uh, we have Wows. Wows uh, in the Super Chat says, I looked for your doctorate work and couldn't find it. You did seem to advise many students uh, work. Um, if you want it, go to Fordham University. I'm, I, th I think it should be in, in the, the, maybe the library website. We, we had to, we had to, to, to give the document there, but if you look up, uh, you find where, find wherever it is. It's not, it's, this is where, this is where the, uh, doctoral dissertations go, but go to David Wood. And the title was Hume Draper and the Bayesian argument from evil. So should be, shouldn't be hard to find. 
And MJ Jackson says the whole melting pot concept is more American than it is biblical. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you mean by that because if if you mean that you know the the the, the idea of the melting pot is uh, all cultures sort of melt together into one into one culture rather than you know each each culture being preserved. Uh, so I don't know if you're mean, you, you're meaning you know the melting well, pot in a, in a positive or or negative sense because. Um, uh, you know, biblically, yeah, you can have your own culture and yet still be united, uh, be one in Christ. That's why Paul says, you know, male and female, you know, slave yeah. and free, you're all one in, in, in Christ. So, yeah, it depends on what you mean, but, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, actually, yeah, I know MJ Jackson personally. You know, that's, that's one of my guys. And so that and, and how you articulate that at the end, I think that's exactly what he's getting at. As a matter of fact, he's got a channel, too. He's got some dope work out there. So I, I would encourage people to hit him up uh, on his channel as well, the uh, Urban Christian Institute. But, um, you know, to, to your point, though, is like I think many times people – there's a difference between distinctions and division. Mm -hmm. I'm saying we can yeah. be distinct that's a good point. and not necessarily be divided or divisive. You know what I'm saying? And I think that, you know, that's, you know, when we are, when we have that, you know, diversity and unity kind of melded together, then um, it's a beautiful thing, you know, even, you know, even uh, in the body of Christ. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, guys. Well, we are, uh, we are officially out of time. We are planning on being back. Uh, might be the Flutane. Well, Flutane clan is going to keep coming Flutane back. Flutane clan. As long as people are quarantined, we're going to come back to, uh, to chat with people. And uh, I might figure out how to actually get, get, uh, get some people on so that they can call in. Uh, that might be cool. Oh, that'd but be cool. Uh, I think it, uh, I think tomorrow night it'll be me, you and John McRae, right? What do you mean? Is that the plan? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think John's going to hop on and, um, you know, maybe we can, uh, twist vocab's arm. I think Vocab said he can't be on till Sunday, so that would be a different. Uh, he did yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah, guys. We basically got like five or six people who are all going to be. Uh, we're all going to be uh, jumping on live whenever we can. And uh, Monday, Monday, Braxton, uh, Braxton Hunter is going to be on. Uh, got a couple requests. Yeah, that's what's up. Yeah, got a couple. Re got a couple requests yesterday uh, for. Hey, could you get Braxton Hunter on? And so I messaged him, and he said, "Yeah." And so he's going to be on Monday. All right. If you so, don't like Braxton Hunter, something's wrong with you, man. He's, he's like the nicest apologist out, man. Like if you, if you have a problem with Braxton Hunter, something is just that's evidence that you have a depraved soul, right there. <laughs> it, 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 it actually it actually reminds me of you in the sense that that I, I haven't watched anything by Braxton Hunter. I just know multiple people are saying, "Hey, Braxton Hunter, Braxton Hunter's cool and he's smart, so oh, you should yeah, uh, yeah you should check him out." So yeah, he's sharp. Yeah, he's yep. sharp. All right. Well, uh, God bless everyone. Stay safe. Um, uh, if you're, if you're young, if you're young and you think you might have coronavirus, stay away from old people because they, they do have, uh, they do have a bit more, uh, trouble, uh, beating the virus. So stay away from your grandparents, stay away from, uh, your, your old parents and stuff like that until, uh, basically until, until uh, doctors have basically optimized their, their, their chances of, uh, living. Uh, in the meantime, yeah. we'll see you all tomorrow. Peace.